The counters mined the planet with nuclear charges. We're all about to die. You know something, my boy? I wouldn't be emperor if I didn't have some powers at my command. Imperial battleship, halt the flow of time. In the space of three minutes, every molecule on this planet will be immobilized. But after the third minute, the green ray loses its power. Time will flow once again, and everything will explode. Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of verisimilitude, your sommelier of science fiction or cinema, your archbishop of Banterbury, your chancellor of cheerfulness, your pharaoh of physical media, and of course, your existential Mr. Rogers. Let me pop open my sparkling water, Robert Meyer Burnett, and I am coming at you. That is right. I am robcasting it. You, you imagination connoisseurs, you members of this, the post geek singularity community. And I want to thank you all for being here. I know that Disney earnings call is, is something everyone's talking about. Are we getting new Star Wars movies? Is Black Widow going to go to Disney Plus? When are new streaming shows happening? Is there going to be an Ahsoka Tano series? I don't know yet. I'll talk about that tomorrow on the, uh, on the John Campia show. But today, after all, there was a new episode of Star Trek Discovery, an episode of Star Trek Discovery that I had been talking about a little bit, Terra Firma Part 1. Apparently, we are getting Terra Firma Part 2. It's not like the first episode of the season. It was called Part 1 that I'm sure the final episode we will get Part 2 of. Now, uh, I got to say, I was going to do a stream yesterday. I had it all worked out. I was going to talk about Star Trek storytelling and how people ask, well, you know, what is a Star Trek story, Rob? You know, I mean, uh, who's to say? Well, the great thing is there is uh, there is to say what a Star Trek story is because the original series and Star Trek The Next Generation had story Bibles written, a writer's guide that was actually given out to anybody that was going to potentially write for the show, whether they were going to be freelancers or staff writers. And the Star Trek The Next Generation Bible was, of course, written by both David Gerald and Gene Roddenberry himself, the creator of Star Trek. So, if you're going to write a Star Trek series, well, then there is actually a document that you can go and look at. And go, here is how a Star Trek show was conceived of by the very creator that created the franchise. Now, that's a good document to have. And what's really interesting is that that the way a Star Trek series was written was pretty much the same. That Star Trek uh, writer's series, the writer's Bible, as I've talked about before on this show, endured for 40 years because you had the original Star Trek series that had its Bible, and then you had Next Generation's Bible that was written in 1987, which was 21 years after the original series was, was conceived. And that Bible pretty much stayed in place from 87 to 2005 because the DNA of Star Trek remained with what Roddenberry had conceived of even back in 66 or even earlier, if you want to talk about the cage, which so much of uh, this postmodern era of Star Trek is based upon. And uh, I think that one of the things that I, people are always like, now, oh, Rob, you know, you just, why, why don't you just stop watching if you don't want to watch Star Trek anymore? If you don't like it, if it doesn't make you happy, just stop watching. Well, for me, I don't really think that's an option only because Star Trek as, a, as an entertainment, as a myth, as just something that I've enjoyed, it's not just to me a television show, it is a pop 
culture phenomenon icon storytelling genre that has developed literally over my entire life. Uh, I was born <clears throat> a little bit after the original series debuted. I started watching the show myself as a young lad when it had gone into strip syndication, and as I've explained many times, Star Trek has lived and grown and changed as I have. Um, there has been always Star Trek in my life, whether as a child, um, when I started watching the show, I realized very quickly there's only 79 original episodes that were being broadcast, but then we had the animated series, which was 22 new episodes. And then in the wake of the animated series, I got things like technical manuals and photo novels and actually original novels, some of which, like David Gerald's The Galactic Whirlpool, were written by actual people that worked on the original Star Trek series. And in my mind, I did not differentiate because I was not going to get any more shows. I didn't sit there and go, well, you know, these novels are, uh, they're not canonical. No, they were just Star Trek stories. I had the Gold Key comics, which later became, well, the Gold Key comics, which clearly were made by people that didn't, well, the artists had never seen the show. Famously, you had you had a fire coming out of the shuttle bay sometimes because people didn't understand that the uh, Enterprise wasn't necessarily a rocket. And if you hadn't seen the show, hey, you had to live through that and go, ah, you know, there's giant man-eating plants in this. None of the crew looks like they're supposed to. The, You know, but you live through it. And then, of course, you heard rumors they were going to make, Philip Kaufman was going to make a movie. The first Star Trek feature film was going to be called Planet of Titans. That's where the original design of the Star Trek Discovery, uh, Star Trek, the Starship Discovery comes from. It was originally designed by Ken Adam and Ralph McQuarrie. There was different study models done of that ship. There was miniatures constructed, paintings done, illustrations done. But, and Tashira Mafune was going to play a Klingon. That film was never made. Then there was talk of doing a new Star Trek television show, which was going to be called called Star Trek Phase 2, of course, famously. You can read the story of that uh, show in Judith and Garfield Reeve Stevens' book, The Lost Years. And, of course, there were 13 scripts written, two of which were later adapted as episodes of Next Generation, uh, The Child and Devil's Do. And one of them was made as a... Uh, well, two of them actually were then made as fan films, as Star Trek uh, New Voyages movies, The Child and Katoomba. So that's kind of interesting that they were made as well. But so then we had Star Trek after the Star Trek Phase 2 series was scrapped and turned into Star Trek The Motion Picture. Then we got a movie series, which led into Gene Roddenberry's revival of Trek. We all know the history as we move forward through time. But for me, personally, as a Trek fan, I got Trek moving and growing and evolving my entire life. And it always showed me something different. Even even Enterprise, which is not everyone's favorite show, but I think there's a lot of worthy episodes in the series. Maybe not as many episodes that are worthy that were in previous shows, but still, Enterprise was the last of the Roddenberry Trek with Roddenberry's DNA in it directly in terms of talking about what a Star Trek story was. Then... Interestingly enough, in Star Trek 09, the J.J. Abrams revival of the show, what they did for the very first time in Star Trek history was they rebooted the original series. Rather than continue to grow and give us something new, they have gone back in time and they have started to rebuild or reconstruct or I would dare say erase what Star Trek was supposed to be. And that has continued on. Star Trek 09 or the Kelvinverse, which was a different universe until last night's episode of Star Trek Discovery. Uh huh. Anyway, so the Kelvinverse was supposed to be an alternative universe, even though it had our Spock. The, the idea of time travel in the Star Trek universe has always been convoluted. But anyway, now, as we move forward, we have Star Trek Discovery, which is pre-TOS, concurrently with now Star Trek Strange New Worlds, of which, by the way, I might have seen a script page or two from. Uh, and then there is, or more, uh, uh, and then there is going to be a Section 31 show. So effectively, we're going to have three different Star Trek series that take place around the same time 
or just before the original Star Trek, which is effectively retconning the entire original series, in in effect, replacing classic Star Trek, replacing Roddenberry's vision with a new postmodern vision of what Star Trek is supposed to be. Uh, An empire of people are working on Star Trek now, uh, an evil empire, let's call them a mirror empire, that is working on Star Trek that their mandate is to change essentially what Star Trek is, and yet telling us they're not. But that's all right. Um, So that's where we're at now. Now, I thought it was very interesting for people who might uh, uh, be curious. There is a lot of, of fans these days who are upset about various ver- their various uh, fandoms. And th- they're, they're upset, I think, for the, all the same reason. They feel that, and I don't want to speak for everybody, but many fans, longtime fans, fans like myself, who have liked things for a while, are, are not getting the kind of experience from these franchises that we used to get. Uh, they're, they're giving us different experiences. And they're, it's, it's very interesting because all of these fandoms, whether it's Doctor Who, whether it's Star Trek, uh, whether it's Star Wars, there has been, I, I, I've never seen it in my life. Now, let me be clear. There has always been bitching and moaning and complaining in fan circles about everything. Do not think that this is something new. It is not. Uh, I've spent a lot of time bitching. I mean, you know, when Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan came out, I did not like the uniforms. I was like, what is this? Belt buckles with the Starfleet insignia on them? Everyone's wearing, you know, pea coats you'd wear on the conning tower of a of a of a submarine as it's cruising before it goes goes to uh, periscope depth in the North Atlantic. I mean, why is everyone wearing these really heavy wool coats on the Enterprise? That makes no sense at all, especially coming after Star Trek the Motion Picture. Whether you like those uniforms or not, <clears throat> the kind of uniforms that went from Star Trek the Motion Picture to Star Trek 2, it's like, what? What happened to the color-coded uniforms of the past? You know, there's always been bitching and moaning and complaining about certain things. But those were always details. Still, the story of Star Trek II was something people dug. Well, what's really interesting with all of, I think, all of our, our uh, all of our, I don't know, the, 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 the call them the, the, the fran- what do you want to, we, we need a new word. I don't know what the word is, but all of these franchises and what's happened is the stories and the franchises we used to love were, for the most part, telling timeless classical tales. And in the case of Star Trek, and I'm going to get into this a little further, the idea of the kind of stories that were being told was fundamentally, fundamentally, a Star Trek story was about humanity that it achieved enlightenment and all of our petty differences and petty squabbles had been overcome. And because of that, we were now allowed through our technologies or we had allowed ourselves to evolve to the point where we could set out amongst the stars. And what a Star Trek story at its most fundamental level was all about was about how we as human beings had got our shit together and we were now cruising out amongst the stars to find out what's out there, to boldly go where no one has gone before. And what would happen is we would find things out there that were reflections of our current day. So our enlightened humanity would go out and find things that would represent the unenlightened or the problems of today, but those problems were out there. And we could see throughout out that interaction or whatever happened out there we learn something about ourselves. But at its core, humanity had evolved. And make no mistake, Star Trek was about the very best of us. Now, how do I know this? This is not my opinion. This is actually the DNA of the show. Now, I would like to read, this is the Star Trek The Next Generation Writer's Guide. 
And this was written, uh, it's it's credited to Gene Roddenberry, although David Gerald assisted, March 23rd, 1987, 33 years ago. Now, uh, this starts, at a, and it, it, of course, tells us what's very interesting about this. It gives the Star Trek, uh, I guess you'd call it the mantra. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. Her continuing mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, and a change to boldly go where no one has gone before. No man is gone, no one, meaning everyone, all of us, all of humanity. And it goes on, and um, here's the ship's mission, according to Gene Roddenberry, to expand the body of human knowledge, to provide assistance as required to Earth Federation colonies, commerce, and travelers to provide for Earth Federation security, to seek out new life, new civilizations, to provide further understanding of the universe and humanity's place in it. Who are we? Where have we come from? What are we about? And where are we going? Quite simple. And it goes on and gives us uh, a, a, a an overview of the ship, the characters and everything. Now here has what Gene Roddenberry said should not change in a Star Trek story for the next generation. The same band of brothers feeling and sisters too, of course. That's how it's written. A large part of the success of the original Star Trek series is attributable to the fact that it was not a star and co-star series, but a family ensemble in which the continuing characters felt great affection for each other allowing the audience to identify with and share that same feeling of affection. The same action-adventure format. We now have more freedom and story latitude because our series bypasses the networks, because it was in syndication, and is made directly for television stations. As before, without neglecting entertainment value, we invite writers to consider premises involving the challenges facing humanity today. The 1980s and the 90s, obviously this was written in 87, so particularly those which interest the writer personally. The new Star Trek episodes will continue the tradition of vivid imagination, intelligence, and a sense of fun, while still assessing where we humans presently are, where we're going, and what our existence is really about. What is changed from the original series, uh, and it talks about the crew and uh, the characters and all of that, um, which we all know, and there's no reason for me to <laughs> read something you all know so well. What we must have in every script, <clears throat> action, adventure, drama, entertainment, involving our starship, crew, and vessel. Plus, once the above has captured the audience's attention, we want to include our usual comments about the challenges humanity now faces. Now, here's what Gene Roddenberry gets into very specifically about what a Star Trek script must have. Believability is everything. It is the most essential element of any Star Trek story. If you're in doubt about a scene, you can apply this simple test. Would I believe this if it were occurring on the bridge of the battleship Missouri? If you wouldn't believe it in the 20th century or now 21st century, then our audience probably won't believe it in the 24th. Especially the people must be believable. Just as believable as if they're living in our 20th century. The crew of the Enterprise are intelligent, witty, thoughtful, compassionate, caring human beings, but they have human faults and weaknesses too, although not as many or as severe as in our time. They have been selected for this mission because of their ability to transcend their human failings. We should see in them the kind of people we aspire to be ourselves. Not the people that we are, but the people that we aspire to be. This is an essential element of Star Trek that modern Star Trek is failing utterly at Roddenberry said they've been selected for this mission 
because of their ability to transcend their human failings. Star Trek, modern Star Trek, is a show that's all about human failings, all about the failings of the crew. And uh, that is something that, according to Gene Ronberry, was not in itself Star Trek. A good Star Trek story should have both a science fiction element and a personal element. The science fiction element should be thought-provoking and visual. It need not be a huge galactic event or even a planetary one. It can be science fiction on a smaller, more personal scale. The personal element of a Star Trek story can be a human dilemma created by either the nature of the characters, by the plot, or by the science fiction element. Again, whatever it is, the key is to show the characters in the story acting believably. We often get our best Star Trek by showing how real human beings cope with fantastic situations. Please remember that the major hero of Star Trek has always been the Starship Enterprise and her mission. The ship is not just a vehicle. She is the touchstone by which all of our characters demonstrate who they are and what they're up to in the universe. Here's what doesn't work, according to Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry in a script. We have found that the following does not work at all. Stories which do not materially involve our own crew. Yes, we do like to see interesting new characters, but only when used in addition to interesting storylines involving our continuing characters. Two, we do not do stories about psi forces or mysterious psychic powers. No matter how fantastic the events in a story, the explanation must be extrapolated from a generally accepted scientific theory. We have accepted the telepathy of Lieutenant Deanna, uh, Commander Deanna Troy to acknowledge the possibility of such abilities, but you will note that we have limited Troy to reading only emotions. Three, we are not buying stories which cast our people and our vessel in the role of galactic policemen. See the Prime Directive. Nor is our mission that of spreading 20th century Euro-American cultural values throughout the galaxy. No identity politics for Mr. Roddenberry. We are not buying stories about the original Star Trek characters. Kirk, Spock, McCoy, Uhura, Chekhov, Scotty, and Sulu, or their descendants. As much as we all love our original cast, and they are our children after all, we need our audience's attention centered on our new characters. That's an utter failing of Star Trek Discovery and Star Trek Strange New Worlds in its very conception. Gene Roddenberry did not want to do that. Now we have modern Star Trek that is all based in or steeped in or built upon original Star Trek. We're now going to have, well, we've had three Star Trek series. Now we're getting a fourth in Strange New Worlds and probably a fifth in Section 31. All of modern Star Trek is going back to previously existing Star Trek, which is the antithesis of what Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, wanted. So Star Trek's growth as a medium, as a storytelling medium, as an entity, as something that Gene Roddenberry conceived of it to be, is not there in all of modern Star Trek's beginning with Star Trek 09. Writing fantasy instead of science fiction was something he didn't want. The difference between the two is profound. Despite the fact, again, Roddenberry's words, despite the fact that both science fiction and fantasy can deal with unusual events, a science fiction story is based on an extrapolation of a generally accepted scientific fact or theory. Fantasy, which our format does not pr permit, need have no basis in reality. Again, most of Star Trek Discovery is fantasy, not based on any actual science. Again, these are Roddenberry's words, not mine. Six, writing sword and sorcery, knights and princesses, stalwart yeomen and dragons are not science fiction for our purposes. Again, we have a tardigrade, uh, that tardigrade DNA, essentially call him a dragon, call him a creature, call him what you want. He can travel the spaceways just because. He can go through the micellular network. Half of Star Trek Discovery's very premise is based on fantasy, not scientific reality. 
So from a Roddenberryan standpoint, Star Trek Discovery fails utterly in terms of what he originally wanted. Number seven, treating deep space as a local neighborhood. Too often, script ideas show characters bouncing from solar system to solar system, planet to planet, without the slightest comprehension of the distances involved or the technologies required to support such travel. Fine and even fun on Space Rangers, but not on Star Trek. <clears throat> Again, the spore drive was a fantasy element that was designed to be able to allow our crew to hop, skip, and jump around the universe in an instant. Um, again, flies in the face of what Roddenberry wanted from Star Trek. Eight, Star Trek is not melodrama. Melodrama is a writing style which does not require believable people. Believable people are at the heart of good Star Trek scripts. Do you believe any of the characters on Star Trek Discovery? Do you believe Captain Picard in Star Trek Picard? Do you believe any characters in modern Star Trek, aside from Anson Mount's Pike, who was the only character who seemed to really realize that he was on a Star Trek show? No stories about warfare with the Klingons or Romulans, and no stories with Vulcans. That was number nine. We are determined not to copy ourselves and believe there must be other interesting aliens in a galaxy filled with billions of stars and planets. Number 10, stay true to the Prime Directive. We are not in the business of toppling cultures that we do not approve of. We will, hey, you can commit genocide against the Klingons though, right? We will protect ourselves and our mission whenever necessary, but we are not space meddlers. 11, plots involving whole civilizations rarely work. What does work is to deal with specific characters from another culture and their interactions with our own continuing characters. 12, mad scientists are stories in which technology is considered the villain. It doesn't make sense for a group of 24th century interstellar travelers whose lives depends on the successful workings of their technology to be Luddites. Number 13, stories in which our characters must do something stupid or dangerous, or in which our technology breaks down in order to create jeopardy. Once again... All of season three of Discovery, our technology, the premise of the entire season, is anti-Roddenberry. Let's break down our technology in order to create Jeopardy. That's literally the premise of the season. Our people are the best and the brightest, and our technology is tried and proven. Likewise, our characters are very committed to their ship, their crewmates, and their mission. Please do not have them abandoning or betraying the same because they have fallen in love with a beautiful pirate princess. That's what Roddenberry's idea of what Star Trek was, is, uh, or Star Trek used to be. It's right there. If you want to know what a Star Trek story is, look no further than the creator of Star Trek himself. Now, what's very interesting is it seems to me what we've been getting with modern Star Trek, as we have been getting with many of our modern franchises, whether it's Doctor Who, whether it's Star Wars, whether it's Star Trek, is new creators, obviously, they want to put their own stamp on something. I get it. I'm a creator myself. If I'm going to come work on something, I want to make it somewhat my own. I get it. Unless, of course, I'm working in a in a, a franchise uh, that doesn't that that has been around for a long time. And I think the fun of working, at least to me, the attraction of working in a known franchise would be to continue that franchise in an interesting and creative way, but still honoring the franchise. Not coming in with this attitude of, you know what, I'm going to, I've been given the keys to the kingdom, I'm going to change, I'm going to change this franchise and make it something more palatable. You know, Star Trek has always been a, a show where uh, it's always been very uh, idealized and all that. So let's turn Star Trek into a platform where I can bring my modern political beliefs, my modern political beliefs to, and 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 do that. Well, that's not what Gene Roddenberry said to do. Gene Roddenberry laid it out. He was talking about classical storytelling, timeless storytelling, where people are not going to mention, oh, I don't know, how they're going to use language to define themselves, language that's based in... Uh, 
the 20th century, which is over a thousand years from where our show is taking place now, or 21st century. Uh, it's very, it's right there. You know, you always have to go back. I always talk about you don't get what you deserve, you get what you, go, what you negotiate. They should have made this Star Trek Writer's Bible uh, part of the, the contracts for anybody who's going to work in this franchise. You have to adhere to this writer, Writer's Bible because that's what the creator of Star Trek wanted. You didn't want someone else to come in and say, no, 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 no. You know, we're going to reject that because it's it's the modern day and we're going to do things our way right now because, hey, aren't we so enlightened as people? No, I mean, you could actually do a Star Trek episode about a culture that is rewriting their past or they're taking something that wasn't broken and you had a bunch of new people come in and say, you know what, this this thing that was working, this creative endeavor that has endured for half a century, eh, we're going to make it different. We're going to change it because we know better than those people. We know better. You know what, those pyramids, we can build better pyramids now. What do they know? They built them with slaves 4,000 years ago. They're old. Let's update them. You know, let's, let's use different building techniques or whatever. We don't even know how the pyramids were built, and they're still here. Anyway, I don't know if that was a very good analogy, to be honest. <clears throat> anyway, so for anybody who did watch Terra Firma yesterday, the new episode of Star Trek Discovery, well, what's very interesting about it is uh, Paul Guilfoyle is in it, uh, Captain Brass from the CSI uh, shows, and he plays a character that violates every single notion of Roddenberry character development that he describes in the writer's Bible. Um, we're asked to believe that somewhere in the 32nd century on a planet uh, that a combination of, by the way, nowadays, in the 32nd century, the only way anybody really knows anything is is because there is a generic... The, the burn has now become a generic, uh, lazy way to get past any kind of information we don't know. Like somehow, that because of the burn that destroyed dilithium, which also apparently destroyed subspace communications, it also apparently destroyed all the data banks. So any information that existed back in the 23rd century no longer exists in the present. Uh, all they have done, all the writers have done in discovery of this se this season, have 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 made this dystopian future is just generically fucked up. However, however, however things are wrong, however things you need, whatever story, whatever impediment the the story needs to move forward, the 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 future is they don't know anything and they need the discovery. It doesn't matter whether they need the discovery spore drive whether they need the Discovery's AI, more importantly, whether they need Michael Burnham. They have now given us a show where our characters and our ship and our information, everything about our principal characters is what the future needs in order to succeed, which is exactly the opposite of what Roddenberry wanted. What is, what is really interesting about this show is... Is they've 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 their central premise is that our ship, which has gone a thousand years into the future, <laughs> they're the saviors. It's not just Burnham anymore. It's everybody. It's the discovery itself. It's Saru. It's it, all of us. All of our characters from today have become literally the Flash Gordon, the saviors of the universe of the thirty second century. That to me is the very worst kind of science fiction because you know what if the overarching idea of the story is is if the end of the tale it became apparent that oh unless the discovery had moved forward in time they wouldn't have it, 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 that, that only at the end do you do you realize that hey the involvement of our crew actually did help but now we watch a show where the future is so hobbled and, and if it's not hobbled enough, the writers will hobble it even more to give the discovery something else. Like as if the burn, the, 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 the signal that they track down, all of this can only be helped by our characters. I mean, they've basically written 
in my mind, the worst kind of, of we talk about Mary Sue stories. Um, it's now our, it's not just a character. It's the entire, our, our heroes are the ultimate Mary Sues. They, they don't even need the future. They just have to show up with their technology and save everybody. Save everybody. Well, um, they've got this cockamamie idea that, well, first of all, let, let me address something that I'm going to give full credit to Michael J. Crawford, the anti-trekker. Now, I did reach out. Uh, the anti-trekker is somebody that I watch. I've been on streams with the anti-trekker. I like the anti-trekker. Uh, I would, uh, um, everybody, if you're interested in Star Trek, uh, the anti-trekker, that's his channel on YouTube. He does an analysis of Star Trek Discovery and Star Trek in general on his channel. Um, he did a review today of the episode. Now, if you don't want to be spoiled about today's episode, Terra Firma Part 1 of Discovery, I wouldn't necessarily uh, continue on because I haven't got to today's episode yet, but I'm going to get there now. Now, in the uh, today's episode of Discovery, the anti-trekker makes a good point. He said that so much of Star Trek Discovery has, has become like every other CBS show, and it feels that way because a lot of network television writers have moved over to Discovery. A lot of the shows are people talk around tables or in rooms, or they're literally, sta in this episode, they're literally standing in one place. I guess blocking, directing shows now, you don't even have to do that. You just, you stand in one place and just talk. Well, in, in this episode, they deal with the fact that Philippa Giorgio, the, the empress of, or the, em, the emperor of the mirror universe, the, the, our Giorgio died, but the emperor of the universe is now having a big problem because she's gone forward in time and she's from an alternate universe and she's gone forward a thousand years and apparently the mirror universe is drifting away from our universe. How that works, I don't know, but whatever. But the anti-trekker, had this, and I, he pointed this out. Now, for those of you who don't know, in Star Trek 09, they created what is called the Kelvin Universe. It is a Star Trek pocket universe that was created when Nero's ship, the Narada, was thrown back in time to 25 years before James Kirk took command of the Starship Enterprise. 25 years before Star Trek, and it created a divergent timeline, an alternate universe that our Spock went back to. There has been talk since then that because of Discovery's visual reboot, that it canonically does not match the original series, and, and that's the time period it's existing in, that nothing matches. People have said, is Star Trek Discovery also set in a different universe from the Star Trek universe that was comprised by the original series, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and Enterprise. So the Star Trek that we'd watch from 66 to 2005 is one timeline. That is one Star Trek continuity. And then the Kelvin timeline was a different divergent universe. And then this new bad robot uh, secret hideout Kurtzman era of Star Trek is supposed to be part of the original Star Trek timeline, but nothing looks the same. Nothing is canonically the same. So it's been, for a long-time fan, like myself, it's very difficult for me to reconcile everything that they have in the uh, modern era of Star Trek because it doesn't track. George Ao is because she's dying. She's basically coming apart because she's too far away from her universe and uh, whatever, her reality, whatever it is that bonds us, or what, some gobbledygook, she's going to die. Why is she going to die? Because they need to get her off the Discovery. They need to get her away from the 32nd century because they need to get her uh, back so she can star in that Section 31 show that they've been developing. Well, in the show last night, I kid you not, using the combined knowledge of the Sphere data and 32nd century technology, the, the computer magically comes up with a solution. Yes, I. she was going to die. David Cronenberg thinks there's no way to save her. But the computer, once again, our godlike magical AI that can combine the information over a thousand years can extrapolate. I know where you can take her. There is one planet in the galaxy where you can take her and solve her problem. 
Here's the magical place to go. Go to this planet. <clears throat> and they literally go to that planet to solve the, like, hey, the, the, I, the green, the emerald chain, whatever, the bad guys are going to move against Starfleet, whatever the hell's going on. Let's go to this alien planet because we were told to by essentially our God that is, I mean, why, why shouldn't the discovery, not only did Roddenberry want the ship to be the center of the universe for our characters, why not just make that center of the universe God? We've already got Jesus. We've already got a Messiah on board, so the ship itself, let's make the discovery God. Well, anyway, so God has spoken, and God has said, go to this planet. Like, go to this planet, not like what you're supposed to find there. I mean, think about think about how big the Earth is. Let's say you're out in space, and all you know is you're supposed to go to Earth. And you get to Earth, and you're supposed to, like, beam down to certain coordinates or whatever. Like, you didn't really, uh, we don't know if, I guess God could give you the actual coordinates, but still they had to walk there, so why wouldn't they just beam directly down to where they're supposed to be? But no, I kid you not, they beam down, they start walking through the snow, and Captain Brass, Paul Guilfoyle, is there. Uh, a man dressed in 20th century garb, early 20th century garb by the looks of it, and reading a newspaper and smoking a cigar. I kid you not. He's just there, and he's very surreal. You know, he's standing or sitting in a chair next to a doorway. A portal, as he calls it. A portal. Gosh, I wonder who this is. I wonder where they are. His name's not Doctor Who, is it? Well, for those of you who know anything about Star Trek history, You'll know that one of the most celebrated episodes of the original series is called City on the Edge of Forever. And of course, in that episode, we find a planet. And on that planet is the Guardian of Forever, a time portal. Since before your sun burned hot in the sky, I've awaited a question. This is a machine that is billions of years old. Uh, this is one of the most celebrated episodes of not just the original series, but Star Trek in general. And of course, we know that in this episode, Dr. McCoy ends up going back in time because he he's, gets sticks. Uh, once again, my I'm 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 uh, suffering from some weird. Oh, it's still so anyway, we're watching. If this is a Star Trek show, and there's just a dude from the 20th century with a newspaper, and the newspaper has a headline that Philippa Giorgio is dead. He's, he's well, for anybody who knows anything about Star Trek history, they know that Harlan Ellison wrote the script for City on the Edge of Forever, and it was very different from what initially made it to the screen. It was heavily rewritten, rewritten by the uh, Dorothy Fontana and... Uh, other members, but mostly Fontana, rewrote that script and it became one of the most celebrated episodes of Star Trek. Well, in Harlan Ellison's original conception of that script, the Guardian of Forever was an old man, was a character, was a, a dude, was a guy. So clearly and and by the way they have no explanation of who this character is they don't explain like city on the edge of forever did a great job of establishing the guardian of forever now one of the things about star trek history as we have seen it the guardian of forever only appeared twice in canonical star trek history in star trek for all of the time travel shenanigans that went on in star trek the guardian of forever only appeared twice it appeared once in the first season episode City on the Edge of Forever, and it appeared in the beautiful animated episode written by Dorothy Fontana herself, Yesteryear. Now, of course, The Guardian of Forever has appeared in fan films, it's appeared in many novels, it's appeared in comics, it's appeared in Star Trek lore, but only twice filmed uh, in Star Trek history. They stayed away from it. They stayed away from it. They stayed away from The Guardian of Forever. I, there's even a story, I think it's on Trek Trek Movie, uh, about Tracy Torme in the second season of Next Generation had a story where they'd use the Guardian and Spock would have, there'd be two Spocks. And of course, even novels like Spock Must Die. I mean, the Guardian is something that people have talked about a lot. But Star Trek stayed away from it. Why did Star Trek stay away from it? Because of Harlan Ellison. 
Harlan Ellison would not have been pleased. Harlan Ellison has passed away, and so has his lovely wife. So what is they what have they done? Now, of course, in this episode, they literally beam down to a planet, they meet a guy, and the guy says, Hey, walk through this door and your problems will be solved. Literally. They don't explain anything about him. He talks in riddles. But what you will find out, and I'm willing to bet you'll hear the writers talk about this at some point. They're going to say, Yes, indeed. Here is the guardian of forever. That's right. Here is the guard. And for those of you who don't know the thumbnail of this show, today's show, there he is. There is a, a picture of him. There's the original Guardian of Forever on the top, next to my face. There's Paul Guilfoyle on the bottom as the new slash Doctor Who Guardian of Forever. And here next to them is artwork that appeared in the recent adaptation, or not the recent, but a couple years back. They adapted Harlan Ellison's real script for Star Trek. City on the Edge of Forever. Not, I mean, the real script was the one that got made, but they went back and adapted his original conception of it, and this is how it was drawn So, uh, uh, in that comic. So you now have a Doctor Who-esque representation of the Guardian of Forever, who is now ambulatory, I guess. Does he have to stay on that planet? Because I guess that donut, you know, those ruins or whatever, hey... Doctor Who's cool, so why not bring Star Trek and Doctor Who together in some way, shape, or form? Now, and, and and apparently we didn't know. The Guardian says that he can't change the way that he was made to deliver history. Uh, and the Guardian of Forever should look exactly canonically, whether it's an alternate universe or not, because the universe then, if the Star Trek Discovery universe turns out to be the Kelvinverse, that Kelvinverse was created by a divergence that happened way late. So the Guardian of Forever should look exactly the same. But hey, who knows? We'll find out next week, won't we? But again, did that make any scientific sense? You know, what was interesting about the Guardian of Forever was it was mechanized. It was a machine. And, and the thing about it being a machine, it was designed and built to offer the past in this manner, as it says. Flat out says, and you know what? From a science fiction standpoint, you buy it. You're like, okay, I believe that. I'll buy that. I'll buy off on that idea. Um, and and it can only do things this one way. But now the Guardian, you know, the Guardian of Forever, it, it, it already knows what you want. You don't have to ask it a question. It knows why you're there. Apparently it read your mind because it knew you were coming. So it read into your past already. Or who knows? Maybe the godlike computer in Discovery knew that you have to contact the Guardian now and say, bruh, here's our problem. Can you hook us up? I mean, Philip and George Al, she's got this problem. But no, it already knew this Guardian knew whatever because, hey, it's time, right? The time portal as presented in City on the Edge of Forever doesn't know what you want. You know, it, it, it it's there to answer questions and show you the past in a, in a certain manner. But it's up to you to figure out how you're going to use it. Uh, but not now. Now we've got a, a funny, we've got a, 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 a mirth-filled guardian that that will tell jokes and it already knows what you want when you get there so uh, i guess it's no longer technologically based it's fantasy the way it was portrayed in last night's episode is well i guess today's episode is is a fantasy again it's just another violation of what star trek is and when you are watching this as an astute viewer of storytelling i look at this and i say to myself what the fuck is this you know, they did a really good job. It was it was what Harlan Ellison wanted to do with his original City on the Edge of Forever script. It might have been interesting, but it wasn't what Star Trek needed. It it needed to be shaped as many uh, writers had their script shaped by Roddenberry and Gene Kuhn and Dorothy Fontana and people who wrote for the original Star Trek. That's what they had to do. That's what TV uh, showrunners do. They they take outside ideas or spec scripts or, or commission scripts, and they rewrite them to fit the framework of the show. That's what a showrunner in the writer's room does. So anyway, I know we're going to hear someone say, hey, isn't it cool that we went back to Harlan Ellison's original conception of The Guardian of Forever? Isn't that neat that we did that? Well, I would say no, it's not, because what you're doing is once again... It's not Roddenberry Star Trek. It's ugh, and not. I love Harlan Ellison. I really do. I think you should all crowdfund and help support the realization of the last dangerous visions that J. Michael Straczynski was spearheading or is spearheading. 
Get involved. I've been waiting my whole life, literally, to get The Last Dangerous Visions. I'm happy to get it. But, um, you know, that doesn't mean that The Guardian of Forever, as portrayed in the original Star Trek, was not the better idea. Was The Guardian of Forever, as, as shown in City of Age of Forever, better or worse than Paul Guilfoyle? I leave that up to you. Anyway, that's all I wanted to discuss today about Star Trek. Let's see what you guys have to say today. And, and I don't know. First of all, should we dip in and see uh, see if any uh, interesting information um, so yeah, why not? Why not? Why not? What have we found out in this Disney meeting? Well, the Mandalorian spinoff Ahsoka Tano and Rangers of the New Republic are in the works, part of Disney Investor Day. Well, that wasn't a surprise. Um, just as we told you, a Mandalorian spinoff series is already in the works from Jon Favreau and Dave Filoni, the Rangers of the New Republic and one centering around Ahsoka Tano. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, see, you didn't even have to watch that. Um, there is an Alien series in the works at FX with Fargo creator Noah Hawley, and Ridley Scott is in advanced talks to EP. Handmaid's Tale was renewed for season five at Hulu. It's good for, that. Good for you there. Uh, this is all news that has just dropped, so hey... An alien series. I, I'd be interested in that. Noah Hawley doing an alien series. He couldn't get his Star Trek movie off the ground, so I'm down. Uh, there is the latest. Um, wow. And, oh, this is good. I'm going to talk about this because this is amazing. CAA boss Richard Lovett to Warner Media's Jason Killar over HBO Max. The blind side was entirely unacceptable to CAA and the clients we represent. Ooh, as many people know, in uh, on the show, we've been following the ongoing story about how Warner Media uh, and, of course, HBO Max just unilaterally decided to take their entire 21, 2021 slate of films and make them day and date in movie theaters along with HBO Max. So you will not only see Wonder Woman 84 show up on Christmas Day in the theaters and on HBO Max, but everything that Warner Brothers was going to release in 2021, including Godzilla vs. Kong, including The Matrix 4, and including Dune. Problem is, as we all know, when you make deals in show business, it ain't show friends, it's show business, and you don't get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate. And what you negotiate has box office bumps in them. So this disruption has far-reaching ramifications. Let me read this article very quickly. CAA is the latest to blast Warner Media on its decision to place its entire 17-film slate on HBO Max at the same time the films are released in U.S. theaters in 2021. Sources say that in, at an agency staff meeting, CAA president, CAA is considered... Uh, one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, talent agency in the world. CAA president, as a matter of fact, we did a uh, whining about movies about Tootsie, which came out in 1982, and CAA was depicted in that film, an early depiction of CAA on film. Richard Lovett read aloud a letter that he sent to Warner Media CEO Jason, I don't know if it's Keelar, I want to say Keelar, but else, let's say Kalar, detailing the agency's beef over the Warner Media HBO Max announcement, along with the repercussions and long term damage the move will do to the theatrical film ecosystem. Lovett made it clear that the future relationship between the agency and its powerhouse clients are at stake here. Uh, this is coming on the heels of the DGA, the Directors Guild of America, objecting to this. I've just gotten a copy of the email Lovett sent to Kilar. The agency would not comment or confirm, but read it for yourself. I'll read it. Jason, this is from the president, the head of CAA, Richard Lovett. The blindside Warner Brothers announcement Thursday was entirely unacceptable to CAA and the clients we represent. So we are clear about what is unacceptable. You made a decision to release our clients' movies in an unprecedented manner a simultaneous release theatrically and on your own streaming service, HBO Max, without consideration of our clients' desires or, and this is the most important thing, contractual rights. 
It plainly violates the rights of a number of our clients who hold approval rights over distribution plans and streaming selections. Your determination to release our clients' movies on HBO Max at the same time as in theaters effectively torpedoes the theatrical release and dramatically harms our clients' ability to earn back-end compensation, which they negotiated for expected and have every right to protect this is a huge deal because what happens is by doing this move they might warner brothers and hbo max might be in violation of not just one or two contracts but many many contracts which could wind up there's there's huge legal ramifications or as we talked about maybe uh at&t their parent company anticipated this and figured nope we're going to make good. We're, we're we'll 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 assume that we'll say okay, let's pretend that these movies made half of what they were going to make at the box office, which means you'll get half of your box office bump. But who knows? Because AT and T is already 150 billion dollars in debt. So what's a few more billion dollars in payouts for this 17 film slate? They'll get over it. So maybe they're maybe they're ready to do that. Um, you chose to release our clients' movies on your own streaming service without any input or discussion with our clients, and you made no effort to negotiate with or otherwise seek out market rate deals with other streaming services. This is the epitome of a self-interested corporate maneuver intended to benefit your company while wreaking havoc on the industry and ignoring and greatly damaging our clients and uh, creative and financial interests. To the extent you negotiated a license fee with HBO Max, which remains unclear, we reject that entirely as it is the job of their rep representation and is, in many cases, a violation of our client's approval rights. You made a decision about movie distribution based on your opinion about the potential theatrical marketplace when it is impossible to predict that marketplace through the end of 2021. Indeed, it ignores the very real possibility of a vaccine in quarter one or quarter two of 2021 that would likely result in a reopened theatrical market with a robust demand. Without any apparent basis, you have taken a contradictory position for the domestic and international marketplaces, seemingly with the belief that the international marketplace is safe and strong enough for our clients' movies. In doing so, you have ignored the reality that the compromised domestic theatrical release will hurt films' international performance, will hurt all of the downstream distribution channels, and will therefore hurt our clients. And let make no mistake, he's also talking about how much his clients are going to earn, which means they're hurting CAA. This is not CAA being some kumbaya, CAA needs their, they need their cheddar too. You unilaterally determined a value for our clients and their work to benefit the long-term prospects of HBO Max and the finances of at and a choice that our clients did not make, and a value decision that is out of sync with the marketplace and other streaming platforms. That is absolutely correct. The bottom line is that you are trying to take advantage of our clients to benefit your company. Neither we nor our clients will stand for it. Worst of all, in a business relationship, you violated trust and boundary. In doing so, Warner Brothers has made a statement that relationships with artists and their representatives are not important to the studio. The leadership of CAA has worked with Warner Brothers for nearly four full decades. At one point, Warner Brothers took pride in the studio leaders' relationships with artists. Today, the only scarce resource in our business is talent. To insult talent this way is to redefine your company in a way that is a major setback. We reject the deals you have made with yourself on behalf of our clients. Our clients' contractual rights will be enforced. Our lines of communication are open, but our point of view is clear. I love it. Go CAA. They're absolutely right. 100%. You go. You go, Richard Lovett. Um, wow, it's almost like, I don't know, it's like Texas trying to get the election overturned in other states. It's crazy. Crazy stuff's happening, kids. 2020 is ending with a bang, let me tell you. Anyway, let me get into what you guys are saying. I've got many letters from, uh, first of all, uh, there's somebody, uh, there's someone's letter I want to get to. I want to find it. Um... Mm -mm -mm. There was somebody who was calling me to the table for not reading their letter. And I, let's see, I wanted to find where that is. And I can't find it. The mic made sure. So our friend, uh, Captain Opinion, I think, 
has written me a number of letters, but he did not go through proper channels. He did not go to the uh, fill out the actual form, and he, he he wrote me three letters and was taking me to task on something. He even made a video about this, and uh, he made a video about reservoir dogs, and I wanted to respond to him directly on video. So, in the movie Reservoir Dogs, there is a scene where a Freddy who's played by Tim Roth, the undercover cop that infiltrates nice guy Eddie and Joe, uh, Eddie Cabot and Joe Cabot's organization. He gets, he infiltrates uh, uh, their organization and gets put on the team that commits the diamond heist that is at the center of Reservoir Dogs. There's a very celebrated scene in this movie where his commanding officer tells him that he must learn a story, an amusing anecdote that happened on another job to somebody else. And he has to learn this, and the, the, his superior officer says, L listen, you have to learn this story inside and out, and we're giving you the basic framework, but you need to make the story your, your own. You have to come up with the details. Like if you go into, the in the story in a nutshell, uh, this character went into a bathroom with a bag of pot that he's going to sell, thinking he would just take a leak or whatever. And when he goes into the bathroom, there are four police officers in the bathroom with a drug sniffing German shepherd. Now, what do you do? Tough situation. So the character explains how he went cool as a cucumber, went, relieved himself. Then he washed his hands. Very cool. He even put the bag of pot right down on the sink and walked out. And that story was supposed to ingratiate himself to the criminals because they would understand that was a tough situation to be in. So in the movie, it is established as uh, our character has to learn to be an actor. He's told, you got to learn to act. you got to be Marlon Brando. You've got to be a great actor to tell this story. Now, in it, you see him learn to tell the story. He gets the story from his commanding officer. Then he starts to make the story his own. And then we actually see him he's over and over and over, and he's doing what his commanding officer said. you got to come up with your own details. Like, did the sink have that pink granulated shit that they have in high schools, or did it have liquid soap? Was there paper towels in there, or was there a hand dryer? So all of these things he has to make his own. Now, I maintain in the movie, when you see Tim Ross' character talking to to Chris Penn and Lawrence Tierney and to Harvey Keitel as he's telling the story to them, it then actually cuts into a representation of the story as it was happening, as if Tim Roth was, 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 this was happening to him. Now, I maintain that that is a fabrication. What you are seeing is what is in Tim Roth's mind as he is telling the story. Tim Roth... This is not something that ever happened to him. He did not act this story out. It is not his memory. It is what he, as an actor, has done. He is being in the moment. It's, it's, he's learned the story so well that in his imagination, he sees what's going on. And how, we, how do we know this for a fact? Because at one point, when he's actually in, he's, you see him in the bathroom, you see the four cops, you see the German shepherd, that never happened to Tim Roth, ever. It's in his mind. But because, as any great actor does, he's in the moment. He, as he's telling the story, sees this in his mind's eye. And we know this because there's a shot from the camera that's swirling around Tim Robbins as he's... Tim Robbins. Uh, Tim Roth. As he's telling the story. Now, our friend, Mr. Opinion, thinks that I don't know what's going on in that scene, that I am wrong in assuming this. I do not think I am wrong. He made a video saying that I was wrong about this. I disagree. I think the whole point is to show what a great actor he is. And he has come up with all those details. And that's what he's got in his mind's eye. And when you get to the swirling camera and it's stylized, suddenly he's stopping and he's looking at the cops still telling the story, shows us that this is his imagination. This is how good he had to be to be a, a undercover officer. And what it does is it tells us he's not just telling the story. Uh, this is just a representation of what he's doing as an undercover cop all day, every day. He's that much in the moment. That's my opinion. Anyway, he took me to task on that and was complaining that I hadn't read his letters. But I hadn't read his letters because he hasn't been sending them to me, going to the website, 
and writing them in the proper form so we get them in the normal fashion like everybody else. So anyway, I just thought I would bring that up and answer him. I've got two other letters that he wrote that I will get to. Hayden Burke is here. Hayden Burke says, Hey, Rob, I feel as if we don't often discuss the benefits of franchise continuations or crossovers. For example, by canonizing previous iterations of a rebooted franchise, studios are able to garner new interest in their old catalog. The Spider-Man crossover got me thinking. Children and newer audiences of today bypass the older films as they technically, up until this point, haven't counted towards the current storyline. By introducing a multiverse and canonizing what was once thought lost, fans and newcomer audiences alike now will go back and watch older installments, binging in preparation for the big culmination. I think it's a great idea. And there is money for studios to make out of franchise films that may have faded into obscurity over the years. Do you tend, do you find uh, you tend to marathon films in, in a series prior to a new installment? I do. And to be honest, I love the idea that multiverses can now extend my current franchise box sets to new lengths. <laughs> I love the idea of placing my Tobey Maguire films next to my Andrew Garfield ones and watching them all back to back, knowing that they have a true connection with one another. Uh, Hayden, great letter. I Absolutely. That's why, you know what? If somebody had said to me, and I know they couldn't because the anti-Trekker points this out, that Star Trek Discovery is the past of the Kelvin timeline. The interesting, See, the interesting thing about that is that the Kelvin timeline was actually created at a fixed moment in time, which means that the Narada incursion, which occurred 25 years previous to, say, the original series about that, means that everything before that time in Star Trek history was the same. And then the divergence happened and created the split off of that universe, as if I know, as if time travel and alternate universes are real. But let's just assume they are. If you had just told me that from the beginning, I'm like, okay, I still would fucking hate Star Trek Discovery as a bad television show and bad science fiction and worse, bad Star Trek. I would still hate it for that reason. But I would hate it less. I would hate it less. I cannot stand how these new writers have been going back and changing Star Trek history and, and doing it badly. You know, bringing in modern identity politics, making people, I know there's a lot of viewers like, oh, I see myself in this show now. Well, you're not supposed to see yourself in this show. You're not. You're supposed to see what you could be if you were better than you were, or better than you are. The fact that people can see themselves in Star Trek, oh my God, Tilly's just like me, or means that it's failing. You're supposed to see people you aspire to be, not see yourself. You do not, you're not supposed to see yourself reflected in Star Trek. If you do, Star Trek fails. Well, but Spock's got a learning disability, and so do I. I could be just like Spock. No, you can't. You can't. And Spock doesn't have a learning disability. He never did. The whole point is that Spock was the Uber Vulcan. He was able to, uh, through incredible odds, was able to be a man of two worlds, even though he wasn't welcome in either one entirely. But anyway, let's not digress. But what I do like is if it is a multiverse, then you can enjoy it. You can move over and watch Star Trek Discovery, and it doesn't diminish my enjoyment of the original series because the Star Trek Discovery universe is being written by hacks who don't understand Star Trek and never will because they want to turn it into what they want it to be as opposed to what it is. And, um, or other TV writers that watch the blocking. Watch the blocking of the, literally... Philip and George Al, they have a, a hologram of her standing there, and you've got Colbert standing there and David Cronenberg standing there. They don't even move. They're not even walking around. They're standing in place. It is the most boringly conceived and directed scene ever, but ooh, it's got special effects in it, so hey. But you know, you move around, then the effects become more difficult to do. But anyway, still, it's like everybody talks. They stand around and talk. Go to Cestus Three, run away from the Gorn's uh, explosions. Do something. Um, anyway... Anyway, that's just a digression. I would love it. I love that idea. I think you're Hayden. You're absolutely right. Good on you, sir. I think, or maybe Hayden, you're maybe, I don't want to assume anything anymore in this day and age. Uh, however you identify yourself, male, female, non-binary, trans, whatever. Um, Hayden could be a good name. I know men named Hayden. 
girl's name Hayden, so I don't want to assume anything. I don't want to make an ass out of you or me. So thanks for writing it. It was a great letter. And you're absolutely right. I love it. I make these mul- I, you know, I don't think everything should have a multiverse, but science fiction shows, comic book movies, Doctor Who, they can because that's, you know, that's something that that's part of the whole genre. Uh August Ragon, August Ragon uh is here. I hope I got that. August writes in, "Rob, thanks for doing all that you do." I've been a fan of science fiction, horror, etc., media since I was a child, catching monster movies and The Outer Limits on TV. I became a fan of Trek back when that's the only Trek there was, pre-animated series. Here we are, all these decades later, still talking about and sometimes still enjoying Star Trek. Well, someone recently tried to Trek-splain me (laughs) why Trek is in the current state that it is. Someone recently told me that a person they knew made a case that Star Trek used to be for more hardcore nerds, but now that it's mainstream, they gave examples of other franchises, they've had to dumb things down, particularly plots and character development, and that's part of the key problems that cause certain fans to reject it, or at least struggle hard like the previous iterations of Trek. My response was, if Trek over the last 50 plus years was hard to understand, why have we so many series and movies since the 70s? If Trek wasn't accessible, uh, we wouldn't be talking, or accessible, we wouldn't be talking about it now or arguing over new iterations. I told him that person's logic was fundamentally flawed. While Trek appealed to many different age groups and walks of life in its first run, the next wave of fans, when it hit syndication in the early 1970s, usually stripped Monday through Fridays at 6 o'clock, were largely 12-year-olds. So is this... That's true. Uh, So is this person saying that the current producers are now forced to dumb Trek down for mainstream audiences? What does this say about this contempt as it infers that today's audiences have lower IQs than the average 12-year-old in 1972. Now that's science fiction. Obviously, there are far more components at work, including time, place, movies or television series, etc. There's an entire treatise that could be written on this isolated topic alone. But instead of prattling on, I'm more interested in hearing what you have to say about this. Keep your eyes on the stars. August Ragon, author... I can't. Oh, that's right. August wrote uh, E.J. Subaraya... The Master of Monsters from Chronicle Books. By the way, I can't believe, August, you're writing in because I I told you I have my book right over there. I love that book. It is awesome. E.J. Subaraya, uh, he was the special effects maestro and director and all of those things for Japanese movies. Godzilla film, kaiju movies, Ultraman, all kinds of things. Uh, he was a master, and that book is awesome. That book is so good. I love that book. Um, August... Once again, you and I park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay. I think we live in a a different time. I think the real problem with uh, Star Trek and the real problem with a lot of this genre entertainment is a. I think it's a function of where our society is at. And I think that, unfortunately, when... When Star Trek debuted in the 60s and 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 into the 70s, when I was a kid growing up, there was a focus on general education. And I I think that uh you know learn like Viger, learn all that is learnable. And when I was going in my elementary school for instance, we had a music class where we learned to play like 500 miles on the recorder. And um I'd never played a recorder, but that was my first experience with an actual instrument and learning to play it. Um, And I think there was an emphasis in my elementary school on learning a lot of stuff about a lot of things. But what going to my school did was instilled an idea or a, a thirst for knowledge in me. And I think a lot of people where you realized that you never knew when you learned something when it could be useful. The more you learned about a lot of things, the better off you were. Just general knowledge. I mean, we even learned things, home economics class. You learned how to write checks or you learned how to balance a budget. You know, you learned how to cook. There was all kinds of general knowledge in addition to sports and band and drama and all that. And uh, 
knowledge itself was prized. Education was prized. And when you would go to school, I think there was an attitude where you had to do the work. Like you were expected to perform. Like you couldn't skate through school. I mean, some kids did. There was always problematic kids and all that. But but I think that there was an attitude about knowledge. Remember also when Star Trek first came out in September of 1966, we hadn't landed on the moon yet. The space program was in full swing. You had Mercury, you had Gemini, you had uh, the space race was happening. And in 1969, July 20th, 1969, we landed on the moon for the first time. Star Trek had gone off the air. So the, the ramp up of the Apollo program and the space race was while Star Trek was first on the air, and then we had landed on the moon. And by the time it went in to strip syndication in 72, that was the last year we went to the moon. So you had a generation of people, kids especially, I was one of them. I wasn't quite 12, but I was growing up with people actually going to another planet. And then through the through the 70s, I mean, we had the Vietnam War. We had incredible technologies that were coming out. I mean, digital watches, man. Uh, there was all kinds of interesting innovations happening. And I think that was part of it. And then as you find out, if you read like Jonathan Haidt's The uh, Height, Jonathan Haidt, if you read The Coddling of the American Mind, they have a, a demarcation point where things started to change in the 80s with education and parenting. Uh, whereas the focus became more like suddenly it's cliche now, but the, every kid gets a trophy generation, helicopter parenting, all there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, I, I won't get into them now, but there's a lot of reasons that our culture shifted. And I think one of the biggest problems with that is the idea of what a general education means and the way our, especially parental attitudes toward education also shifted. Now we live in a world with, the, I think, the rise of social media. And this is just my own personal theory. When you can carry around, you know, your your phone and um, you can design what <clears throat> input is coming into you. And if it's only input that's stimulating to you, you're not, you, you, you're not stumble, you don't get to stumble across information that might stimulate you or cause you to pursue different avenues of growth. And I think our entire especially in America, it's all about like college kids revolting on campus against their their professors or demanding what they want. It's so weird to me, but that is the cleanest and most easy to understand example. Like, okay, everybody wants the world now to be the way they want it to be. Like everybody wants to be an activist. They all, <clears throat> we demand these things on campus. We want, we want basically our society to be perfect. We want, we want social activism. We want no discrimination. We want people of color to have everything they want. And they've been put on indigenous peoples. Every, every, everything that's wrong with society, everybody wants right now. Because they've all been conditioned over the last 30 years to, 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 Whatever they need, whatever they want, whatever they expect, they want the world to be perfect now. Let's right all the wrongs of the last thousand years of human history. Everybody who's been a, a marginalized person must get exactly what they want. Unfortunately, while that idea is probably a, a lofty goal and eventually we'll get there, I always have to turn around and go, the universe is indifferent to your suffering. The bubble that you live in, whatever bubble you, whether it's a social media bubble, whether it's the bubble of your privilege that you can go to a college that even allows you to talk shit like this about your own faculty and your own campus. And the, I mean, it's amazing to me that kids go to college, they, they work their asses off to get into Yale or Harvard or Princeton or an Ivy League school, and then they start bitching about school policies or, or in John Hopkins, in the case of John Hopkins University, they find out that, uh-oh, this abolitionist was found to, he owns slaves. Uh-oh, let's let's render everything in the, the establishment moot. You know, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. As I've said on the show, go back far enough, you'll find somebody being oppressed. The one thing about humans that you can always guarantee is that there are groups of one human, there are groups of human beings that will always hate other human beings for whatever reason. And if you go back far enough in history, you will find that every single group of people that ever existed on this planet has been oppressed by some other group of people. The point is, is we want to move forward and not oppress people anymore. That's what we want. No more oppression. We are one race of people. 
but we're all still going to, you know, have our divisions. Let's let's have our political divisions, our identity divisions. Let's get tribal. So, you know, let's get a tribe together so we can go after another tribe. Even in the in the name of, well, we're we're we're, we're, we're we want a more verdant and uh, hopeful and open world. We want every we want every human being to exist without any troubles or any emotional problems. We want everything to be kumbaya and perfect. Nope, 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 nope. That's not the way it works. But anyway, I think that's what's happened. To answer your question, I think we now live in a world where uh, the see what I what I find strange about the universe and uh and i i don't understand this about star trek even star trek to me the biggest failing of modern star trek since this letters about star trek is that our characters now we have a group of characters that can fix every problem in the universe and the problems are not external anymore they're with their fellow people like, let's fix Burnham. Let's fix Tilly. Let's fix Stamets. Let's fix Culber. <laughs> They're not science fiction stories anymore. It's all stories about... Basically, Star Trek Discovery is a story about therapy. It's a tale of how does every... How do our characters get over their trauma, get over their shortcomings, and all of that? Which is the exact opposite of what a Star Trek story is. And I think at the end of the day... What's really frustrating is no longer the, the things that attracted people to those stories in the first place were the action adventure science fiction of it all. But now it's all about people learning to grapple with their, oh, let's, let's, everyone's going, since everyone's in therapy now and everyone's on, uh, on, uh, mood altering drugs or whatever, everybody now, our world is now looking, how can I be happy? How can I, how can I feel better? When before, Star Trek really wasn't concerned with how you were going to feel better. Star Trek's characters, as Roddenberry wrote in that writer's guide, Roddenberry wrote that we're already, we're over all that. We already know, we already know how to get over our traumas. We're that actual, we're that self-actualized. We're that good. But since in this day and age, there's so much identity politics and everyone's, we have to be nice to each other. Well, see, the universe is indifferent to your suffering. The universe does not care. If you are out on the final frontier, you better be self-actualized. You don't have any fucking trauma. And if you do, you already have the tools instilled in you to get over it yourself. That's why you're in the future. That's why they're making shows about you. If you're going to bring your trauma onto the bridge of the Enterprise, I mean, that's not saying that you can't feel, certainly Picard felt trauma after the Borg incident. That's why he went home to Labar, France, to his family um, uh, vineyard. But you know what? He got over it. He wasn't sitting in his vineyard for 25 years writing fucking books. No, because we get over those things. But now modern Star Trek has turned into a show where if you look at all of it, what is going on in Picard? What is going on in Discovery? I feel bad. I feel bad. I'm a drug addict or I'm, I'm, I'm depressed or this, that, and the other thing. I've turned into... All the characters are people of today. They're people of today. And who wants to watch that shit? Well, there's a lot of people that identify. They're like, oh, I went through that trauma. I know what it means. I got to get over my trauma. I get it. I, I identify with you. Fuck that bullshit. I don't care. I don't want to watch shows about people. I don't want to watch. I hear enough of it. I hear enough of people's bullshit today. Everyone, I, I'm hurting. I'm, I'm, I'm suffering. Are you okay? Christ, I felt my own trauma. I've been locked in this goddamn room for the last year, practically. I haven't been able to go to a movie theater since February. But you know what? Life is short. Get over your trauma. The world sucks. It's horrible. You're born into a horrible world. You're going to die in a horrible world. You know what you got to do? Make the most of it. And if you want to waste your time getting over your trauma, and I'm not saying it's a waste of time. I'm, I'm just being a little hard. I'm being, I, this is me being the indifferent universe right now. Part of the things that helps me cope is good Star Trek. Part of the thing that keeps me happy is everything I'm surrounded by. It keeps me from spinning off into oblivion, getting crazy, dealing with my own trauma. You know, everybody's got trauma. We all do. Do I want to watch a science fiction show about trauma? Not unless it's caused by the doomsday machine. Not unless I beam my entire crew. They're on the third planet. There is no third planet. Don't you think I know that? There was. But not anymore. They called me. 400 of them. 
That's what I want to watch. I want to watch Matt Decker's trauma. I want to watch him go after the doomsday machine and fail. I want to watch Kirk step in and save the universe. That's what I want to watch. You know? When you have trauma like Matt Decker, you don't get over it. You don't get over it. You steal a shuttlecraft and you fly into the maw of the doomsday machine and you join your crew in death. And in doing so, you give Kirk an idea. I know how to blow up the doomsday machine now. But you know what? If it was Star Trek Discovery, Matt Decker would have gotten over his trauma. He would have been in the sick bay. And Matt, it's okay. It's okay that you beamed your crew down and lost all of them onto the third planet. It was a mistake anybody could make. No, you know what? It's not. Nope, 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 nope. You make those kind of mistakes, you kill your crew, you die. That's storytelling. That's how you learn not to do that again. But anyway, that's just me. <laughs> I'm sure people are like, what the hell, Rob? Uh, but anyway... Let's see what anybody, let's see what someone else says. <laughs> um, by the way, I'm not picking these letters. These are what just what people are writing. Uh, Jordan Thomas writes in and says, "Hi, Rob. It's been a while. I've been out of the habit of listening to your show for a few months as other things have taken over. But anyway, now it's firmly back on the schedule as evenings are spent doing modeling things. Ooh, I like to do that. Send us pictures. What are you modeling? I mean, if it's you know sexy lingerie or if it's a Starship model, I'd like to see them both." Uh, and I want to talk about STD, the horrific current manifestation of what, what, what was once a good thing. Now, I've been ruminating on what I really don't like about this show and all current incarnations of Star Trek since 2017. The 2009 JJ stuff I can just about live with, though I'd not go out of my way to watch any of it twice. To me, it's just a modern homage to the original, much like any remake of a classic film, Day of the Jackal, The Italian Job, etc. And if it's viewed like that, then it's fine, I suppose. Of course, Star Trek Discovery, etc. do not purport to be that, as we all know, and I'm not going to go into all of that as it's been done to death. I did it to death today. I think it's easy to be outraged at the canon violations, the awful storytelling, the deplorable depiction of every single character for no other reason than some weird woke agenda. I could go on. However, many of these things, to my mind anyway, are present day issues. Exactly. Nay, fashions that I have no doubt will pass over time as all fashions do, and maybe one day will be viewed through the same lens as the Austin Powers films viewed the 60s. So then I began thinking, what drew me to Star Trek in the first place? I first consciously watched Star Trek when my mom's friend and work colleague lent me her VHS collection of the original series and the films one through five. I was seven years old at the time, in 1991, and the images of the ships were awesome. They looked believable and most of all real. Naturally, as I was seven and with a seven-year-old attention span, that was about as far as my interest went at that point. But of course, whenever the show appeared on BBC Two and in whatever incarnation, I'd watch. As I got older, I started to follow the stories a little more and started to understand the deeper meaning behind the plots and the situations, but always kept on coming back to the technology and the ships. I had a close friend in school who had started collecting the Eagle Moss models so I could see what a D7 looked like from all angles, what a Miranda class looked like upside down. He then got the Franz Joseph Technical Manual for Christmas, and we poured over all the unseen Starship classes, all drawn up in blueprint form, ready to be built to fly. You, sir, and I park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay. I was the same kid. At the same time, at age 10, I began to take a serious interest in history, which then led me to thinking, well, how did these ships evolve, and what design choices led them to this layout, and so on? Years later, I discovered the amazing uh, Masao... Okazaki and his Starfleet Museum website, where he'd been asking the same questions as I had, but he'd gone a step further and created an entire history prior to the original series. As fans of his work know, he started the site before the creation of Enterprise, and it's such a shame then that the internet wasn't as far-reaching as it is now because many of his designs and histories might have influenced what became established canon, but I suppose that can be said of much unsung but worthy fan fiction. I want to interrupt you there and say you're absolutely right. I think one of the problems was Star Trek, Larry Nemechek told me this. A lot of Star Trek fans, industrious Star Trek fans, became what they called backgrounders. I'd never heard that term, but Larry Nemechek explained it to me. Doug Drexler was one of these people. Jeffrey Mandel, 
uh, Rick Sternbach. They were backgrounders, and they were extrapolating the whole history of the Star Trek universe based on what was on screen. So a lot of what they had come up with looked very canonical. There was canonical fealty all the way through what people were doing because they loved Star Trek so much. They were like, what would this be like if it were real? And that's one of the things that made Star Trek so much fun as a fan. And I had to sort of throw that out as the next generation came because each new series, they the the producers wanted, like Rick Berman and, and Michael Piller and, and Jerry Taylor and Brandon Braga, they all wanted their own versions of things and they weren't so into it. They, they were still people that made these shows, so they weren't fans in that way. So we didn't quite ever get... Well, it would have been much more interesting if I was ever in charge of creating a Star Trek show as a fan, I would have gone back into all this stuff, you know, and made and, and picked and chosen. That's why like Brian Fuller went back. The reason the discovery looks how it looks is because he wanted, he liked <clears throat> the Ken Adam, Ralph McQuarrie design of the discovery. And when he was kicked off the show, the discovery's design was changed. They got rid of the, we don't want circular nacelles because they look dated. We need a cool visual reboot. <clears throat> I think the one thing about the way Discovery looks now is in, in 10 years, it's going to look horribly dated. The colors, the things that they use, the designs, they they look, they're already to me horribly dated, but you're right. My, my point throughout all of this, <clears throat> all of these aesthetic artistic decisions were thought through. What works in design versus what doesn't. I give you the turbo shafts of the Discovery. If this is now what was before, and why is this the way it is, and so on, that is what fandom, that is the single uh, greatest, under. if you want to understand how to do science fiction, fantasy, or horror, and you're going to create a mythology, those are the questions you have to ask. If this is now what was before, if this is the way it is, why is it so? What came before? What would logically come after? And this is what I do not like about modern Star Trek. The ships are shit. Not just, oh, I don't like the design. It's not for me. These ships are shit. The technology application is shit. The design aesthetic is shit. There's been absolutely zero thought put into any of it over and above. Wow, it looks so on trend. The designs are so out of place in this universe that this show will age so fast, it'll be old before the decade is out. I could not agree more. It can be leveled at prior Star Trek incarnations that the set design props, etc., do stick to the design trends of the period in which they were produced in. However, as you yourself have pointed out, Rob, Star Trek is now its own universe. If anything, it's an alternate history with a point of divergence sometime in the mid-20th century. I mean, the eugenics wars didn't happen in 96, did they? Can't say I noticed them. Well, you should read Greg Cox's Khan trilogy, and he'll explain that to you. But I thought, even though I liked his books, I thought he made it, it came from a faulty premise. This idea that the Star Trek universe is from our universe directly. But as you so astutely point out, there was a divergence at some point in the 20th century because we even see, see episodes in the original series, such as Assignment Earth, of things that didn't happen. So it is an alternate universe to ours. What we see on screen from the cage onwards is just how things work here. My own rationale for things looking a bit backward in what's supposed to be the far future is due to a nuclear war and then a chance encounter with an alien race. Technology took a slight step backwards in some areas and then great leaps forward in others. Don't question it. This is just how things work here. It's not our world. And despite certain elements of Star Wars being firmly stuck in the 70s, that's just how it is and it doesn't get questions. Question, Star Wars, uh, for whatever you like or don't like about the stories, the design aesthetics of the Star Wars universe have stayed consistent. One of the joys of the universe. I mean, look, why did Naboo starfighters look different than, say, X-Wings? Well, look at Naboo. And I think that the Star Wars universe has had consistent design over the last 43 years, so that's why people dig it. And I'll tell you one thing, the same, the same approach... Uh, was true of Blade Runner 2049. The Blade Runner future, as depicted in 82, was clearly not our future. It was more of an analog future, and they decided to go with that for Blade Runner 2049. They didn't decide, well, now we've got home computers and things. We have to, like, change. No. They're like, Blade Runner's future, for whatever reason, turned out this way. 
we're going to extrapolate upon what we saw as the future was depicted in 82 in, in 2019. We're going to extrapolate that into 2049. We're not going to change things based on our world. It is an alternate universe, and you must have fealty to that. Now that the show has moved itself 900 plus years into the future, it finally has the chance to rid itself of some of the baggage that the designers obviously feel encumbered with. However, what do we get? More awful ship designs. I'm sure they didn't even bother to draw a book ship, just filled out a wireframe and said, that'll do. Technology, which never gets explained or expanded upon past the briefest mentions, briefest of brief mentions, and some far future Federation classes that we get the slightest glimpse of, and then back to the USS Nonsense Agenda Mushrooms, which has now been refitted to make it even look more nonsensical. That's the point. At that point, I just walk away. Which brings me back to my seven-year-old self. If I was allowed, gore notwithstanding, to watch this show, I'd be asking myself, what was this show all about? I'd expect ships. I'd get crying. I'd expect technology. I'd get some snotty, long-winded speeches and more crying. I'd expect adventure and get a lecture from, from some daft teenager who apparently never heard of David Bowie, who I didn't understand or indeed care about. And then they would probably cry. My seven-year-old self would not care about any of it. And if I voiced that opinion, I'd have been called, in the words of Gary Beekler of Nerdrotic, an ist and a phobe. My seven-year-old self. Yeah, sure. And this is how Star Trek has died. Its flagship show have just wandered off from its family and set, out in the, set up out in the wilderness on its own with some fair-weather BFFs for company. When it comes back home after the BFFs have left it for some other trend, it'll be tired, hungry, and destined to live out the rest of its existence in past glories, where no silly, unfunny parody cartoon, which Adult Swim did far better, can save it. So be it, nothing lasts forever. I must, however, end on a positive note. This Christmas, my son, who is three, is getting a model of the TOS Enterprise. Why? I have a picture of it on my desktop, and he thinks it's cool. But better than that, I've recently finished watching For All Mankind. Yes, it has, it has its flaws, but Ron Moore has done a pretty solid job with it, I feel. But for those of you who haven't seen it, you must, must, must check out the post credit scene from the end of the first season. In my opinion, it is genuinely the finest rocket launch ever shown on any film or TV show to date. And to illustrate its power, ever since showing that to my son, he's done nothing but build Sea Dragon rockets out of Lego. That's what good science fiction achieves. Beautiful inspiration. Uh, that, sir, is a great letter. Thank you, Jordan, for writing that in. Again, you and I park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay. Let's see what you guys are saying over here. I can't believe the show uh, has been going on all this time. I feel like I've been doing this show for two minutes, but that's not the case. Uh, let's see what uh, what you guys have been saying. Wow, you, you've, a lot of you have been saying a lot of things. Uh, let me go back and... Um, I can always look. I thank God for Willow because Willow always is the place where I can. A lot of new members. I want to thank uh, thank you all for becoming a new member. Wow, that's uh, a lot of people. So I'm happy with that. Thank you very much. Uh, Electron Star Collapse became a member. Sean M became a member. Stephen Goggin, our Irishman in Somerset, became a member. Wind Goddess, Joshua, Tom42, Jose Enrique Gomez. Danny Lane, John became a member. Philip Alvarez, Black Philip Alvarez. Maybe you're already a member. I think they repeat these things when I look up here. Willow says, out of curiosity, how do you feel about bald women like Ilea, for instance? Do you prefer women to have a full head of hair? Uh, I thought uh, Ilea was incredibly sexy. I, I have no problem. I think, you know, bald women can be beautiful. I like hair. You know, I like, I like, but I don't like all hair. You know, it, it, it hair I, I i you know what i like the most here's what i like you since you're asking me about women my preference for women what do i like in terms of looks since you specifically asked about that i will tell you the thing that i find most attractive about how a woman presents herself is if it's uniquely her 
I really love it when a woman does things, the, the clothes she wears, the scent she wears, the way she styles her hair is hers. Like, I, 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 I want to see a, a, a woman like that I don't feel it's she stepped out of a magazine or looked at a picture in a magazine and said, oh, I want to look just like that. I, I think there is nothing more exciting or sexy uh, than seeing a woman all, all put together. And, I mean, women, are, women can be art to me. You know, a, a great, and and that's why I like women of of all. And I'm talking all shapes, sizes, colors, and creeds. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't care. Like, uh, I I I just, to me, women are are uh, they're 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 men are lesser than women. <laughs> I've always felt that that women are slightly above uh, above men. Um, not just because they can they can give life, gestate an alien creature in their innards, not that, but I feel that there's a certain wisdom and a knowledge that that men aspire to gain, and we probably never get it all in our lives. And um, uh, to me, a woman who understands fashion as it relates to herself, her own persona, and seeing that all put together, uh, there's nothing better than that. And, and, and women, it doesn't matter what your body type is. It doesn't matter your age. You know what I thought was interesting? I'll tell you uh, something that I thought was really interesting. So the first time that I went to France was when Free Enterprise was at the Cannes Film Festival. I'd never been to France. And I was in Nice and I was in Cannes. And I remember, <clears throat> like, we were in, I was with Mark Altman and we were in Nice. And the women in France blew me away I, I because there's a lot of I would say women that looked different than American women um, a much a much more wide variety of the kind of people that were in France but what I loved about and again again this is me idealizing the time I was there um, all of the women in France they looked proud to me you know they all, they all held themselves like up, and you know I loved the 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 perf the, the scents the perfumes they would wear as they would go by and it would waft through the air. You know I was always like, it, it all smelled so delightful and delicious and sexy and amazing, and the clothes were amazing, and 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 the women just felt so proud, you know. And I I'd never I'd never seen that before, and it really struck me. I'm like, wow, this is pretty interesting and i i loved it i loved it i mean uh, you know i guess when you're surrounded by history and culture and art and again i understand this is me idealizing france uh, at the time i know and but you know nice was also the french connection there was crime and, <laughs> and heroin being dealt out of that city but no there there was uh, at least you know you can't not think of nice that way and you got monaco down the road uh it, it, it was uh i love that so if a woman shows like Sinead O'Connor, man, wow. When you're watching the Nothing Compares to You video, I mean, she was stunningly beautiful. I used to watch that video over and over. I, her, I found her face mesmerizing, and I love that she had a shaved head. Um, you know, I don't. And I have to tell you something else. Uh, as I've gotten older, I know women who have gone in for chemo and who have lost their hair. And now... Uh, as I've gotten older, I equate uh, a woman who's bald with that strength because to me, uh, I guess because my mom is a cancer survivor, that's why I have that the 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 pink Darth Vader uh, head there. I bought that because it supported uh, breast cancer research. But um, that's why I have it. And because um, it reminds me of my, mom, my mom's uh, strength in fighting that disease. And uh, uh, so I, I see strength in, in, in bald women. And, you know, they're also growing up in Seattle. I knew some punk chicks that were bald. They were always sexy to me. Uh, Jordy Lyons says expectations from Disney's investor call. Uh, well, as we talked about, you know, we got an alien series. I wasn't expecting that by Noah Hawley. Bring that on. That's going to be great. Uh, an Ahsoka Tano series. Uh, if you'd asked me if they were going to announce an Ahsoka Tano series after seeing the last episode of the Mandalorian, I would have said, yes. Why? Yes, they will. So that's not a surprise, but, um, we'll see. I haven't heard about the movies yet. Shall we delve in and see where they're at on the Disney call right now? 
because why not? Let's see where they're at. Um, Swiss Family Robinson TV remake in the works at Disney+. Plus. Turner and Hooch, first look at a canine co-lead Hooch in a Disney reboot. Um, Disney developing R2-D2 and C-3PO animated adventure, a droid story. Uh, Star Wars Rogue One prequel Andor coming to Disney Plus in 2022. First look at the Diego Luna star revealed at Investor Day. Indiana Jones movie shooting next spring. Harrison Ford returning. Star Wars. Oh, well, this is this is mind-blowing. Star Wars Patty Jenkins tapped to direct new movie Rogue Squadron for Disney and Lucasfilm. All right. Okay. I'm getting chills. Uh, I, all right. Disney knows how to, like... Disney knows how to line them up and knock them down because bring that shit on. I love Rogue Squadron. What Lando Calrissian series in the works with Dear White People creator Justin Simeon at Disney Plus. Obi Wan Disney Plus series. Hayden Christensen returning as Darth Vader. <laughs> okay, they win. <laughs> you want to win the streaming wars? Look at what Disney did today. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Let's talk about this. I mean, there is nothing that they've announced as far as Star Wars is concerned. Uh, no Marvel news yet. I guess they haven't got to Marvel yet. Um, Bring it on. <laughs> All of that sounds great. Patty Jenkins directing a Rogue Squadron movie? Come on. <laughs> wow, there's even a logo for the Cassie and Andor series. Even that's cool. You know what? I'm sorry, but uh, yeah, bring all this, bring all this on. Why not? Why not bring all this on? You know, you guys are going to be listening to all this for the next three days anyway. I mean, you know, uh, I think that I think that all this news, Jordy. Uh, how do you not love all of this news? I don't know. Um, honestly, I really don't. Uh, it sounds all good to me. <laughs> um, yeah, why not? Why not? Um, let's see. What can I what what can I find here? Um, uh, yeah, look at that. Star Wars Andor. There is the Rogue One prequel series logo. That's pretty dope. Like, come on. In, let's read. You know what? I want to find out about this. I want to find out about this Indiana Jones movie. So perhaps Disney hasn't abandoned films altogether. Lucasfilm boss Kathleen Kennedy said that the next Indiana Jones installment is on course to go into production this coming spring for a July 2022 release. As previously announced, James Mangold is directing. Comscore currently has it dated for July 29th, 2022. No mention of Chris Pratt, who is rumored to be attached. Just Harrison Ford returning as per Kathleen Kennedy. Uh, Willow, the Willow original series, is coming in 2022. And uh, there you go. Kennedy provided the update today at the Disney Investor Day, in addition to a slew of other news, such as the Mandalorian spinoff series Ahsoka Tano and Rangers of the New Republic. I mean, why not? They've pioneered that whole... I mean, what's not to love? There you go. I guess they haven't got to Marvel yet. <laughs> we'll see as we... We'll just keep checking in and see what keeps... Uh, I don't know. Well, maybe I'll come back. Maybe I won't. Okay, I guess I'm back. Um, Mr. Tickle Trunk says, what does this button do? Well, you know what? Um, if you've ever heard that question, uh, don't ever ask that question uh, of a woman. But Because uh, you should already know the answer. So I can't tell you. Oh, that's what it does, says Mr. Tickle Trunk. Yes. Hapkido Lock became a member of the channel. Thanks, Hapkido Lock. I appreciate that. Jordy Lyons goes on and says, Is this an illegal act to support your favorite creators? I'd like to sponsor the Discovery Bashing segment of tonight's show. Much love. Well, thanks, Jordy. I appreciate the support. Uh, he go on to say, M Mikey Burnham is my hero. She's got a poster on my wall along with Kathleen Kennedy. Their voices let me know all is right in the world. Well, I'll tell you something. Kathleen Kennedy is knocking it out of the park, isn't she? I would say she is. Yes, she is. She was never going anywhere. Remember, she produced E.T. I'm a Kathleen F Kennedy fan. Jeff Yerke is here. Hey, Rob, I want to get your take on something. Is the Mandalorian TV show being set up to become a Mandoverse line of feature films? Seems like that to me with so much attention on supporting characters. Mrs. Y send her, sends her regards. 
LLAP, live long and prosper, the Yerk Man. Well, you tell your lovely wife I send her my regards back. Look, I mean, they're making an Ahsoka Tano series. Uh, we got Obi-Wan coming and Hayden Christensen's coming back as Vader, which is kind of odd. Are we going to see him out of the armor? I guess we would. That's kind of cool. Um, we shall see. Um, it all sounds good to me. Bring it on. I don't know if they're going to make movies. They announced Rogue Squadron. I think that's a great idea for a movie. How cool is that going to be? Uh, can't wait. Uh, Paul in Long Beach says, Yo, Semite, just sending a note to wish you a happy eight nights. That's right, Hanukkah starts tonight. And to all of our friends celebrating tonight, happy Hanukkah to you and your friends and families. From your buddy down at the beach, Baruch Atah Adonai, Loheinu Melech Alam. Uh, never mind, I won't get into that. Um, well, thank you, G and Tile. <laughs> all right, Paul, thank you very much for that. A broken elevator sends in a tip and says, "Are you okay? Are you okay with the retcon of Green Lantern's Alan Scott that makes him gay? You said before you're not a fan of Star Trek doing any retcon of Spock. Are you okay with Alan Scott? Why would you not be okay with Spock? That's an interesting question. Um, well, I'll tell you something. I, I again, I I can't. I don't know off the top of my head if this is true or not. I don't know enough about Alan Scott's history." I don't know if he was ever portrayed as being in a relationship uh, with a woman. I don't know. That kind of thing, uh, changing... Because here's the thing. Uh, the sexuality of, of comic book characters, when they were conceived, especially in the, in the 40s and things like that, beyond being very cursory, was never really a part of their characters. And, and to me... Uh, uh, you can make a character like an Alan Scott, I guess you can change his sexuality. Now, here's the thing. If they do that, if you're going to make a character gay, if you're going to, if you're going to suddenly decide to make Alan Scott gay, well then incorporate the fact that he's a gay man into the stories that you're telling. How does that affect him as a Green Lantern? How does that affect his daily life? I think that there's great stories to be mined. See, what I would like to... My whole thing is that, is that I think that saddling... They have diminished Spock on a number of, in a number of ways in Star Trek Discovery. Because in the case of Alan Scott, um, it's something that we just didn't necessarily know about him. Um, but in the case of... And in the stories that were being told... So far, there was no reason to ever come across something like that. But the character of Spock, we had seen, you know, depicted throughout most of his life. You know, the Alan Scott character, it's not like we're going to meet him, you know, later in life or something. But with, with Spock, we've seen his youth. We, we've gone through those things. And Star Trek Discovery has fundamentally changed the essence of who he is all over. That the fact that he wouldn't be the man he would was unless he had... Michael Burnham as his adoptive sister. That's what they did was they took another character and said that that character that never existed before 2017, that that character is somehow so important in his life that he couldn't have been the man he is without him. Well, as somebody that watched Star Trek since, you know, when I watched it, that isn't necessarily true. And that's a complete retcon and change of, of his character because that's saying that somebody else... And then the idea of, of him having, again, a mental disability is one of the, the things they've saddled him with because that's how Michael Burnham could come and help him. Now, I know people would say, well, Rob, what's the difference? You know, giving somebody a mental deficiency or changing their sexuality. And I think that the, the difference is, is that in the storytelling that Alan Scott had existed in, Oh, I, I moved. Well, I got my Justice League omnibuses right next to me. Um, they just didn't have those kinds of stories, unless maybe he was. He did have uh, relationships with women. I'm not sure. I'm not up on my Alan Scott history right off the top of my head. But uh, you know, it depends. If the stories are good, if Discovery told me a great story uh, about, say, Spock overcoming a previously unknown disability. I, depending on how good the story was, maybe I could have bought into it or or not, but I don't feel that they did. And I feel that it was it was it was diminishing a character in the service of new characters. And I think that's wrong. And I think that's as Roddenberry said, not let's not bring back our characters. I mean, the the way that the way that Star, why did Star Trek Discovery have to tie Michael Burnham to Sarek and Spock in the first place? 
It didn't. It also violates, as I read earlier in the show, what, what Roddenberry wanted to do. Um, but the fact that, that comic book characters are now, you're now in a realm where we can deal with their sexuality, um, I think it'd be that's sort of interesting. Because we couldn't tell those stories before. So, I mean, if that makes any sense. Um, uh, Jan Michael Zulu, Zulu, Zulu? <laughs> I like that. Uh, or is it Jean Michel Zulu? Anti Trekker is wrong. He misunderstood you here traveled from 20, 2379. Your is the soldier. Uh, is that what he said? I don't know. Um, your here traveled from 2379. Disco isn't from the Kelvin timeline. Your is from alternate 2379. That could very well be. That could very well be. Um, your, is it your here? Uh, that could very well be. I, I don't know. Um, uh, Sean Pullen says anti trekkers theory that this is the Kelvin timeline overlooks the fact that Vulcan now Navarre has not been destroyed. Oh, that's true too. That's true too. Uh, I agree with you there. Um, unless of course, um, that, uh, uh, we are seeing that was new Vulcan all the time. I mean, you have, but yeah, I agree with you there. Jet Screamer sends in a tip and says, it is unwise to give Disco personal transporters if they don't know how to use them. Linus could have rematerialized between decks. I don't even know how people, like you have personal transporters. How is it the transporters know where everybody wants to go? You just hit them and go. I, I don't understand that. Um, uh, hey, Rob, can you post a link to that Trek writer's Bible in the chat? Uh, yes, I can. Um, let me, let me see. Uh, well, let me see if I can just click back to it. Um, we'll see if it'll take me back there. Hmm. I have to go back in my history. Um, yes, I found it. Uh, here is the Star Trek writers, Star Trek, the next generation writers Bible. It's right here so you know what you know what i if the character's name is really your is he he's your the hunter from the future uh that's kind of a if you're a fan of that movie there you go uh so there you go you do have that there in the chat uh blue satoshi sends in a chat and says would the kelvin's mirror universe really be that different what are the odds mirror nero would even have a mirror narada to bring back in time i know I know it doesn't make much sense, but you know what? I have to uh, uh, anti trekker. I gotta. Uh, I gotta say, Sean negated his theory. So, if it's your, your here, the character, um, there you go. Uh, so there you go. I'm uh, anti trekker's wrong, and so was I for putting in the show. So I can admit that. Um, Blue Satoshi says, "Oh yeah, would the Kelvin's mirror universe really be that different? Would the Hobus supernova even occur? Depending on the lore." It was artificially induced. Would whoever caused it even have that motivation here? Maybe not. Again, these are also things that I... Uh, the destruction of Vulcan and the destruction of the Romulan star, the Hobus star, I hate. Because what is that doing? That's somebody coming in and literally blowing up your universe. I don't think you need to do that. Add a catch sound says, they just need to find a universe with competent writers. <laughs> um, I agree. Mr. Tickle Trunk sends in another tip and says, Red Letter Media had it right. Star Trek has been taken over by dude bros and explosion boners. They don't like to think. They just like explosions and saying things like, how about that math, everyone, huh? So they can feel smarter and cry. All the cry. <laughs> yes, and Mr. Tickle Trunk says, Star Trek Discovery went too far. 200 Watt Studio and I now have a pact. We're walking hand in hand into the ocean so nature can take us away from the Kelvin timeline. We invite everyone to a pre-walk orientation among uh, meeting with milk, cookies, and anger. <laughs> uh, Rhett One says, you're on a roll tonight, RMB. I feel you, brother. The universe could care less. And William Wyndham was fracking amazing in that episode. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you for that. I appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, John Orchard says, in the Doomsday Machine, Kirk tells Decker, get a hold of yourself, man. Kirk lived in reality. Yes, because when you're on a starship, you don't have time to cry. There's no crying in starships. 
Uh, Angry Trekkie says, I'm sort of with you, Rob. I'm most unhappy with those that think it's great to fix a person. I was disappointed that this is in modern Trek. First of all, uh, you have to be pretty damn mentally stable for them to allow you to be on a starship. Uh, I would imagine the that's why it's hard to get into Starfleet Command. You have to be a pretty stable individual. Um, Evan Gearhart sends in a super chat and says, whenever me or one of my siblings would have complained to my parents that this or that isn't fair, they would respond, life is not fair. The sooner you realize that, the better off you'll be. You know what? Me too, man. My parents used to say that life is unfair. What happened to that lesson? I mean, now everybody, all everybody, all of this identity politics, everybody's crying out for fairness. Look, I believe that we should all aspire to fairness. I do. But life is inherently unfair. I mean, you know, why do the young get cancer and die? Why does somebody get hit by a bus? Life is inherently unfair. And that's why we should make the most of our existence, no matter what. John Orchard says, The biggest difference between TOS, TNG, and Star Trek Discovery is lighting. TOS and TNG had bright light bridges giving hope. Star Trek Discovery is always dark, giving a hopelessness. You know what? I think there's a lot to be said there. Uh, one of the things that, and Seth MacFarlane said this in our documentaries, one of the things he loved about Next Generation was uh, the fact that everything looked like a, a hotel, but it had to be comfortable. If you were out there on the final frontier, you had to be comfortable. You had to be comfortable out there, and uh, that was important. Um, Brandon Sheehy sends in a tip and says, Rob, the fall from grace of John Cusack's career is always something that saddens me. I love his 90s films like Gross Point Blank, Being John Malkovich, and High Fidelity. Me too. What the fuck happened to him? Why couldn't he transition into quality character actor roles? You know what? I mean, sometimes as actors get older, I, I, I actually love the way John Cusack's face looks now. I would love to make a movie uh, with John Cusack someday uh, and give him something really meaty because I do think he's a good actor. And again, maybe he'll have a resurgence. Maybe a Quentin Tarantino-esque character will come along and give him his Pulp Fiction. I hope so. Uh, 666 became a member. Douglas Baird became a member. John Ortiz became a member. Member Christian301291 became a member. Claude Hibbert became a member. But I think Claude was already a member. John Stevens, Word Balloon. Oh, you guys have been members. These things are just popping up to remind me. A 200-watt studio sends in a super chat and says, I highly recommend August Ragon's book. Good guy, too. Um, that book is amazing. You got to get it. Uh, Bob Koal sends in a tip. Hey, Bob. Uh, I'm surprised, Bob, you even have time to write in. Aren't you preparing for Infestation 2, even more infested? Uh, if you got to see, you got to go find Bob Koal's Facebook page, and he does up his house. It's amazing. And what he did, his Mega Rilla, you got to go find Bob. Trust me, if you like Halloween, you got to go check out Bob Koal's Facebook page. Bob Koal says, You ought to consider streaming during the SpaceX launches. Oh my God, yesterday, two great space-centric channels, Everyday Astronaut and NASA Spaceflight, had combined audiences of more than 1.4 million viewers live. I was watching Everyday Astronaut. That was so great. First of all, can I just, let me just speak a moment about, I'm a space nut, and what SpaceX is doing, and what apparently Richard Branson's going to finally do, uh, send tourists into space, but... Everybody's talking about how the the rocket they launched yesterday failed on on reentry. Well, not reentry. It failed when it landed. Guys, that mission was not a failure. Uh, as a matter of fact, they kind of expected something something to go wrong. It was a test, and they learned more in that test than they ever expected to. And not only that, it worked. That rocket worked. It did things that have never, ever, ever been done before in any kind of aeronautics or manned space flight. Or it wasn't man, but it was unmanned. But it was incredible what they did and the size of it. The fact that, oh, they didn't stick the landing. I mean, literally the engines failed at the end. That's the point of that test. So when everyone's like, oh, it exploded on impact. Like Elon Musk uh, uh, being congratulated by Jeff Bezos. People are like, oh, well, they still crashed. What they did yesterday, make no mistake, it was incredible. As a matter of fact, the science of manned spaceflight uh, advanced yesterday. I mean, it had already been advanced, but the fact that it works, uh, uh, NASA would have taken a decade to do that. It was incredible. And they're going to fire up another one and fix those problems. It's amazing. Um, 
Patty Jenkins doing Rouge Squadron. Laugh out loud. 200 Watt Studio. Come on, man. <laughs> um, Michael T. from High Desert Comics sent in a super chat. Stackpole needs to be brought in as an advisor for Rogue Squadron. I hope he is. And I hope they go back to his books. I mean, they've got the books. If they're doing a Rogue Squadron movie, go adapt the books. Those books are rad. They're right there. Calvin Bose is here. Hey, Calvin, how you doing? I have a theory for City on the Edge of Forever. I think Kirk was an important part of the timeline. It's not that McCoy saved her from dying. It's that Kirk, it's uh, that if Kirk had not taken her to the movies that night, she would not have been out on the corner to be hit uh, by the car. Maybe he is the important part of the timeline and before she was not killed because she did not go to the movies with Kirk. What do you think? Calvin, I think you bring up a really great point. Uh, Spock talks about in that episode, that time itself has currents and eddies. And I've always thought that in my mind, you know, we tend to think of in science fiction as time and space sort of being apart from one another. But what if the timeline itself, that if you suddenly have the ability to travel through time, that you're supposed to be doing that? Like it's too, you, you, you're either, either, either the universe is immutable and you cannot change anything or the very act of going through time is exactly what was supposed to happen. Now we tend to agree or tend to believe that because it's fiction, that the story, all time travel stories all come out of the same desire. I mean, the, the whole inception or conception of time travel came out of out of the desire to I wish we could go back and change something that we've done that's where they originally came from but then of course the idea then becomes what if you could go back in time and change something somebody else has done like killing Hitler or something and then the story possibilities are endless and what if you went back in time what would happen then you know so the, whoever came up with the first idea I don't know if it was HG Wells or something but the, the idea of time travel, that's what great science fiction comes from, great fantasy comes from, because, you know, one of the things about about being a, an imagination connoisseur is just that, you imagine you imagine things. Like, wouldn't it be nice if I spent half my day, day daydreaming about stuff? And, um, you know, I, I think that's where, where we extrapolate, we imagine, you know, the future. And what was, what I loved yesterday, I, uh, yesterday, the SpaceX launch, of starship the fact that i was actually watching a rocket that looked like it belonged in a 50s science fiction movie fly like take off and then come down and flatten out and aerodynamically <laughs> and then manage to turn i mean that was a big rocket they've got they got calculations they have to figure out but it almost stuck the landing. If that thing had stuck the landing, that might have been one of the single most, I, I, in my mind, the single greatest engineering feat ever pulled off by man was landing the Curiosity rover on Mars. Look up the seven minutes of terror. Punch in the seven minutes of terror. And, and, and just to understand what we were able to do to land Curiosity on Mars, I was sitting in a bar in Montreal and watching that, and cacophony of people i was by myself and they had it on the box and i'm like i i i i i, I was and when it happened when it landed and they reestablished can i start tears were pouring out of my eyes because i couldn't believe that it happened it was amazing it was amazing amazing um um so yeah uh uh alexander wilson says Sorry I had to miss the show, but I've been enthralled by the Disney Investor Day. They're almost three hours in and haven't even got to Marvel yet. <laughs> I figured they hadn't. Shall we dip in and see if they have? Because <laughs> why not? I mean, they, they've been coming. Um, they've been coming. Let's, let's, uh, let's see where we're at. Um, <laughs> Sister Act 3 has been set for Disney+. Plus. Darren Aronofsky sends Will Smith to extreme places in a Nat Geo adventure series for Disney. Gabrielle Union, oh, she's a babe, 
uh, to star in uh, Kenya Barris's reimagining of Cheaper by the Dozen for Disney. Disenchanted, the Enchanted sequel with Amy Adams, is going to Disney+. Plus. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Man, they are crushing it. You know, I'm just going to leave this up so I see where we're going to go. Um, Angry Trekkie says, my comment was in context of you talking about life and the world we live in. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Um, well, thank you. Lavender Homestead, subscribe to the channel. Alexander Wilson, subscribe. Well, thank you, sir. Mr. Tickletrunk says, the SpaceX launch yesterday was a total success. I argued with a friend of mine last night. The test was to see what the rockets could do in different phases with one, two, and three rockets. That's why they were turning them on and shutting them down. On landing, it blows up now instead of blowing up later full of people. <laughs> well, that's right. I mean... Remember, they were turning those engines off and on to testing everything. The fact that it 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 succeeded beyond everybody's wildest expectations. But that's the thing about our our our, our culture. It's like, well, it blew up. It must not have worked. No, <laughs> no. Um. Um. Yeah. Uh. It's amazing. Mister Tickle Trunk says says. You pull out all your hair. Right now, we're living in the future. We are living in the future. It's amazing. Uh, Roger Grain said, Hey, Rob, what did you think of Perry Rodan? <laughs> I used to I used to read the Perry Rodan movies, or movies, books when I was a kid. I love those books. I mean, you know, it was, to me, they were like the adult Johnny Quest. <laughs> I think that's why I started reading Perry Rodan. I, I think that's uh, how I kind of thought about them. Um yeah, but you couldn't be a kid. They were on every spindle rack. I mean, I I I loved I love those books. Uh, let's get back to uh, where we were with your letters, shall we? Because um, there's a lot of letters, and I am I am not getting to them. Uh, let's see. I'll read a few more. You know what? I've been on for two and a half hours, uh, <laughs> uh, and there's a lot of letters to read. A lot of letters to read. Um, let's see. Um, mm, 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 mm. This one comes from Desmond. Hi, Toy Man. As usual, thanks. With a lot of movies likely going on streaming platforms, I was curious to understand the following. What does this mean for movie financing, which tends to be on a repayment clock starting from movies development? Ooh, this is a really good question. Streaming services are pushing towards subscriber revenue models. How would the financial repayment for movie, movies now work as the performance of movies are not direct revenue linked to our particular movie like PVOD revenue? I was thinking, uh, would the financing for the movie studios change to a more general loan that's toward the criteria of streaming subscriber revenue versus the movie titles released across a year or quarter rather than, rather than individual movie financing? This is a really good question. It would make sense for streaming services to apply a multi-attribution model of impact with subscriber growth versus existing subscribers versus a movie being viewed as a subscriber lifetime revenue across time. Your thoughts? You know what, Desmond? This is actually an amazing question. So what Desmond is saying is that in the past, movies, people, it is a very risky investment. And people who usually invest in movies, especially independent movies, it's really the ability to say you invested in a movie. That's that's kind of, there's your kind of return because it's a risky business, very risky business. But larger companies that are dealing with studios making tentpole pictures, they can usually, like I've always said that what I'd like to do, if you're going to invest in a movie I'm going to make, I want to make sure you get 30% back. That's my goal, is a 30% return on your investment. Which means for those people, if somebody gave me a million dollars to make a movie, I would like to be able to give them back 1.3 million back in a reasonable amount of time, say 18 months to two years. So they get uh, over 30 years, they they make 30 percent on their money. That's what I would hope to do. If I can't, and and you can't guarantee that you can't guarantee anything in the movie business, but at least you can do enough where you're pretty confident that you can you can give that make that a, a return make that return. That's what you want. But what Desmond's asking is how are, how are people going to make movies now or what's going to happen with movie financing if they're just going to go to a streaming service? Well, I think that's a very good question because Desmond's asking, well, how do you make a profit? 
if you're going to what's what is what is if an independent investor or a finance company wants to invest in a movie that's going to be say a lucrative franchise maybe why would they want to do that anymore i think that's a very good question because now what are you going to do are you going to return so if you if a company is going to invest a million dollars into a movie and they expect because i've told them that they're going to get 1.3 million dollars back um how do they think they're going to make their money. Now, what I would do is I would say, okay, um, under that model, when you're selling a movie to a streaming service, they're buying it from you. I mean, maybe it's a licensing agreement, but the future is going to change. They're going to own everything lock, stock, and barrel. They're going to want to, it'll be a buyout and that'll be it. They'll buy the movie from you and you're done. Um, However, here's what you do. Uh, Movies become more like any other product. And I would think they might become less risky as a proposition. Because one of my dreams, I always talk about Full Moon Entertainment, how I worked at Full Moon. Full Moon was basically making a movie a month, and they knew they had distribution through Paramount, and they knew that through Paramount, they were going to be able, on spending that million dollars, they were going to be able to have so many VHS tapes sold across the country into rental stores and things like that. So they knew that if they made a movie a month, they might, and I don't know the actual numbers, I'm just making it up, but they knew they were going to make, say, $4 million. They were going to get a $4 million return on their initial million-dollar investment. So that's pretty good. So I would think that, and for me, a dream scenario, I would love to have what Jason Blum has right now. You make $5 million movies, and if they're good enough, you know that Universal will release them. If I knew that if I could get into a partnership with a streaming service, and I knew that if we made movies for 5 million or less let's say movies between 2 and th- 2 to 5 million dollars and i knew that the streaming services because of who i was and the quality that we're delivering are going to give me 10 million for the movies that i'm making or if they just told me rob we're going to give you 10 million for the movies that you're making whatever they are sometimes my movies might cost 7 sometimes they might cost 3 then i could go to a bank and say hey I have a five picture deal with Disney Plus or Shutter or whatever and I'm going to make five horror films and they're going to buy them from me for 10 million dollars a piece. I have a five picture deal. Well then you go to the bank and you go, "Okay, look, I'm going to make these movies for 4 million dollars and uh you're going to make you're going to loan me say whatever, the, the amount of money and then we are going to share in the profits." whatever we have left so you know or if they if they are going to loan me five million dollars then i make the movies for three million dollars sell them for 10 i mean it really depends but i think that's what's going to happen uh the idea that you're going to have a breakout hit and everyone's going to make tens of millions of dollars is probably going to go away but in a way i think it could actually stabilize the business what what it really comes down to then though is how much money is there going to be to go around? Will streaming services, if there's only, just like the studios, if there's only a certain amount of streaming services and they only have a certain amount of money, well, what about indie film? You know, what about other things? It's going to be interesting. I don't know, but it's a very interesting question. Um, I really like that question. Uh, and I don't know the answer. This one comes from Evan Gerhardt, or Gerhardt. Dear Earl of Entertainment Enlightenment, Long-time listener, first-time caller, and before I begin my letter, I would just like to thank you for the many hours of enlightening conversation you've provided over the years. There's been a lot of discussion in the post-geek singularity of late about the Jewish influence on the Vulcan species, the casting of Jewish actors, the using of Jewish symbols, the focus on scholarship. But there's another species in Star Trek that casts mainly Jewish actors for the roles, and that is the Ferengi. And to use a phrase of the time, a phrase of the times, that might be a little problematic. Armin Shimmerman, Quark, Max Gredenchik, Rong, Rom are Jewish, and Aaron Eisenberg, Nog, may he rest in peace, was adopted by a Jewish family. Even Wallace Shawn, Grand Negus Zek himself, is Jewish. Now this, on its face, is not a problem, but let's look at some of the other aspects of the Ferengi that may be. First is the design of the Ferengi species, large noses and even larger ears, a common anti-Semitic caricature. If that's not bad enough, 
though those ears are often referred to by Ferengi to describe positive aspects about a Ferengi, i.e. he's got the lobes for business, etc. And let us not forget about the Umox. <laughs> Next is the culture of the Ferengi. I like to describe them as the capitalists of the Alpha Quadrant. They were, they were originally conceived of as the Yankee traders of space. They're obsessed with making money. It's what their whole civilization centers around. After all, their Bible is called the Rules of Acquisition, which every good Ferengi is expected to memorize, much like how in Judaism there is a tradition of memorizing the Torah. Even the Ferengi after life is nothing but a big stock exchange in the sky that you must bribe your way into. The Ferengi believe the universe itself is bound together by the great material continuum or river, which is the idea that all worlds in the galaxy have too much of one thing and not enough of another compelling commerce between worlds. I do not think I need to tell anyone, especially you, Rob, that Jews being obsessed with money is an anti-Semitic trope. Now, do not get me wrong. I love Deep Space Nine and I love the Ferengi. Nog has one of the best story arcs in the history of not only Star Trek, but I would say television in general. Quark and Rom's relationship as brothers is one of the many great pieces of writing in DS9. My relationship with one of the, uh, my relationship with the one most important to me in my life, so I really appreciate that. Ferengi episodes are some of my favorites, Little Green Men and House of Quark being standout ones to me. Hell, even the one where Quark becomes a woman isn't that bad. So I suppose I suppose my question to you, Rob, is have you ever found the portrayal of the Ferengi to be anti-Semitic? Why or why not? I look forward to hearing your response. This is a great question, and it's a question that, you know, I get I get a lot from people. And the see, to me, what what's What's very interesting to me is um, I was raised Jewish and I, I met a lot of different kinds of Jews in my life. And uh, the idea of, of us, of, of the Jewish people being concerned with money, to me, I didn't see that necessarily uh, of course, I you know I was not a Hasid living in the Diamond Districts of or working in the Diamond Districts of New York and all that, but what I saw growing up as a Jew was an emphasis on knowledge more than anything else. Get smart was learn what you can, be a good student. Judaism more than anything else, I think, prizes scholarship and knowledge. Whether it's a knowledge of the Scripture, meaning knowledge of God whether it's knowledge of the business that you choose. Sure, everybody uh, in, in Jewish culture, everybody does expect, yeah, you being, being rich, though, was more of a, a byproduct of, um, of uh, the knowledge that you had. And a, a, the reason, I think, that money a, a, a became so important is because throughout history, the Jews have been persecuted on any number of levels. And they needed money to survive. So that's what, I mean, look at Schindler's List. Look at the black market that they had there. Look at how the Jews cornered those markets. And the reason that Jews are good at business is because it's a, it's a survival technique more than anything else. Now, um, I, I, I understood that anti-Semitic trope, but growing up, I didn't really feel it because uh, I came from a tradition where people expected were expected to learn and yeah do you should you become a doctor or a lawyer or, or those things yes because it was important to have money because money brought you security but i think the anti-semitic trope came out of the idea that the jews will shylock you know what the merchant of venice uh that that Jews, by getting money, were somehow taking money away from people, that we were thieves. And and that that was where I think that the anti-Semitic trope began, where really Jews were just good business people. And um, sure, are there there's a lot of business people that aren't, but uh, and they're unscrupulous and they want to lie, cheat, and steal. But remember... Uh, there's still God to contend with. <laughs> so when you're Jewish, the idea that, that the, 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 I think a lot of the problem is, is that the, the, the reason people have hated Jews throughout the centuries is because they, they were good at what they did and they had a strong sense of family and they were fairly insular because people were trying to kill them all the time. 
you know, there was all kinds of persecution. Let's get rid of you. So they, they had to bond together and have both uh, familial and community bonds that protected not just themselves, but the community as a whole. And I think that's where, that's where that came from. Whereas I, the, 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 the Ferengi to me, when they were first introduced, they didn't, there, that anti-Semitic trope was not a part of them. They were frogs, you know, they were amphibians. They came, they came from, they were, that's where they were, they were from really. And it was Deep Space Nine that really developed all of the Ferengi the way that we know them uh, now. And, and while I can see that the tropes, that it's not how the Ferengi began. They became that way. And I think that they became, the ideas that they were the Yankee traders of space sort of morphed into the fact that they were the uber capitalist. But yeah, I don't think they were conceived, though, as anti-Semitic, um, uh, an anti-Semitic race. I, I never saw them that way. They evolved into the ultimate capitalists, and it was unfortunate <clears throat> that their makeup and things like that, and they they did, again, though, like with the Vulcans, I think it was no mistake that they were casting Jewish actors in those roles on purpose. But I'll tell you something. I don't think that um, I don't think that Quark was ever depicted as as a Jewish stereotype, if that makes any sense. Whereas on the other hand, to me, the Vulcans, were always conceived of as sort of being from the very beginning, with the casting of Leonard Nimoy. Maybe it was it wasn't even uh, overt necessarily, but the idea as the Vulcans developed, there was definitely the idea of Judaism behind the Vulcans. I think, I've always thought that, and I think that idea sort of informed their development, if that makes any sense. Well, listen, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, gentle beings, kind souls, however you identify across these these 28 known galaxies, I wanted to uh, just, I think we're going to end this show now. Let's do, let's check in, let's check in with the Disney investor meeting, shall we? Let's see where we're at. Uh, Baymax, Tiana, Moana, and Zootopia series set for Disney+. Plus. Pixar has Buzz Lightyear movie in the works with Chris Evans and Turning Red from Bao filmmaker Demi Shi. Disney Plus preps African comic book series in partnership with Kigali. So wow, they're they're just they're tearing it up, man. Baymax, Zootopia, Tiana, and Moana shows. Uh, I think Disney Plus they are talk about going all in. There is a level of commitment here that you cannot deny. So anyway. Uh, I want to thank everybody for supporting the channel, becoming members, and becoming um, and sending tips and and all those things and and super chats and sending letters. Thank you very much, everybody here. It's great to have you. I of course will be back tomorrow on the John Campy Show talking about all this inc- insane Disney news. We're not even at Marvel yet. It's unbelievable, unbelievable. So very, very. Very exciting. I want to thank my moderating staff. I want to thank Mike Bodden. I want to thank the Richard. Um, I don't know uh, who's here as far as my, uh, Joshua Levesque is here. MC Blackcap is here. I want to thank you guys, my great moderating staff, for being here. I hope you guys are having fun too. And um, yeah, I don't think we're doing a whining about movies tonight. We'll be back tomorrow. I still don't know what the movie is. I'm just so behind. I, I apologize. We're, we're slacking. Elizabeth is trying to finish her finals. At Art Center, she's doing some amazing things. Check out her Instagram. I think it's E.G. Bell. She put up a stop-motion animation movie of her art. Pretty incredible. Uh, I want to thank you all again. So remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. And with that, I will say to everybody, have a better day. And uh, I mean that.